All right, Scum and Villainy Cantina. Get ready and make some noise and welcome Kevin Smith and Mark Bernardin for Fat Man Beyond. Welcome everyone to Fat Man Beyond. I'm Kevin Smith. I'm Mark Bernardi. Hey! Woo! Uh, holy shit, kids. Welcome to the end of uh, 2023. I know it's not even Christmas yet, so technically the year's not over, but this is the last time we're going to be doing it this year, and so lovely that we get to do it live. If you're watching at home, we are, as always when we're live, uh, in Hollywood on Hollywood Boulevard in the Scum and Villainy Cantina. Put your hands together so folks know you're real. They're real and they're ready to go, man. We got a sold out fucking house and shit and we have a very special guest, kids. We, yeah, yeah. Tell them, Mark. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Downey Jr. RDJ is here, ladies and gentlemen, no? to talk about his role in Oppenheimer. <laughs> um, Which, by the way, I finally saw Oppenheimer. Yeah, I, he he is fantastic in it. If he doesn't get, he's, I know they'll run him for best supporting mm -hmm. uh, actor. He should really be run for best actor. And I'm not saying like head to head with Killian, but I guess that would happen. But I thought he was great. Anyway, Robert Downey Jr. is not here. <laughs> Look at there's that picture, man. That's what he looked like in Oppenheimer and shit. <laughs> uh, no, we wish we could pull that off and shit. No, I've never met him. Does he go to bars? He's pretty famous for being sober now. I don't, I don't know. That'd be horrible if we're like, come get interviewed. And at the end of it, he's like, I'm off the wagon. Yeah. And we're like, come we smell the it. smells. Yeah. I'm back on the circus. I ain't fucking with RDJ, man. I want him being RDJ. I, I like him the way he's been for the last like decade plus. Uh, no, it's not. It's not Iron Man. Um, Somebody told me, though, I asked my agent at one point, this is going back when I first started podcasting. Mind you, I've been po podcasting since 2007. So about 2009 or 2010, I said to my then agent, very important, then agent. <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, hey, man, you know, I, I said, we've been doing this podcast and it's fun as fuck. You know who I'd love to talk to? It's Robert Downey Jr. Is there any way, do you know anybody, man? Maybe he'll come over and they're like, he'll never come to your house. And I was like, can I go to his? And they're like, no. <laughs> and I said, why the fuck? I've seen him do interviews and shit like that. And they're like, you, you are a fucking, like, a very open stoner. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, he's the other guy. <laughs> and I was like, so what? Like, I couldn't just, like, not smoke that day? And they're like, no. Like, your house reeks of weed. <laughs> you run the risk of pushing him off the wagon and shit. So, you know. Sorry. Yeah, but some shit's worth it. <laughs> anyway, Robert Downey Jr. is not our guest. No, uh, our guest tonight is... Very spe better than fucking Robert Downey Jr. I mean, if you ask him, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would hope if you ask you as well. I mean, I like him. <laughs> <laughs> wow, man. Yeah, I know. Again, I, what, how do you talk about me when I'm not around? Shit, you're saying this when he's here. You don't want to know. How I know, about. seriously. <laughs> that guy? Uh, no, my son is here tonight. I know. This is the, the first time he's coming to see me do this live, and I'm sorry, buddy. It's going to get weird. Now, have you ever watched it? <laughs> like, uh, just seen it, like, online? Do you ever watch the YouTube version? Um, I've only seen, like, 10 minutes of a live stream, and then my mom cut me off. <laughs> Good Cause, job. Because my dad was saying bad words. <laughs> um, he, he's like kind of a legend in this place. Like an actual I've legend. Heard. Look at all these people showed up for him. Does you, he do this at home though? Does he fucking hold forth with a microphone and be like, let me tell you some stories. And shit. Uh, first, they're not here for me. I know this because if you were here and I wasn't, they'd still be here. But if I was here and you weren't, 
they wouldn't be here. That's not true. That's not true. I've seen people show show up to there. There'd be like Black eight, Man Beyond. There'd shows. be eight people here, uh, which is fine. We'd all have a blast. But you know, it has always been if the plane goes down, Kevin Smith, an unnamed fat black dude. <laughs> Die in the hills over Akron. That's how they describe Jason Mews? <laughs> He's been angling for that for a long time. Yeah, let's be honest. If I'm going to die next to any podcaster, it's got to be him and shit. He's been around for a long time. Um, I'm trying to fucking boost you up in front All of All right, go kid. for it. Do it. Your dad is absolutely a legend here. Um, we're not just saying this. See? <laughs> Fuck, we paid that guy. But everyone else. Um, you'll see throughout the show, as the show goes on, uh, what keeps it on the rails and the most intelligent things that are said, and also some of the funniest, come from this side of the room. Yeah. I think the audience agrees with me there. Thank you. That was probably the second nicest thing a person has said to my son about me. What was the first? The first Your wife saying, like, your dad fucks like a demon. Because <laughs> he does. Uh, no, no. We, uh, the he, truest thing I'll ever say to you as my son, your dad fucks like a demon. Do with that what you will. Uh, this is why your mom didn't want you watching this show. Yeah. Uh, he and I went to the, the Captain America Civil War premiere. And I think he was like 11. It's going way back. Going yeah. way back. Like we had just moved out here. I had, I had gotten a job for the LA Times. And with that job came like premiere access. Mm-hmm. So we went to the to the the Civil War premiere, we're sitting up in the stands, in the, it was in the Dolby Theater, and there's like the tiers of where they put people in the Dolby Theater, like the floors for the stars of the show and the executives and the filmmakers. Okay. The second tier is for like people who star in Marvel TV shows and friends of the family and kind of journalists, and like the third and fourth tiers are like fans who like snuck in. So I'm sitting on the second tier, and three rows in front of me is Nathan Fillion. <laughs> Some, Somebody just came. I know. T- <laughs> at, the, at the very mention of his name, every knee should bend. Tell me about the filion. What did yes. I do? <laughs> um, and I, I don't know if there is any name that makes me come like that, where I'm like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> like t- tiny earthquakes. Um, and so I know Nathan a little bit because I'd interviewed him a couple times as a journalist. Yes. And, you know, we have mutual friends. We had him on Fat Man Beyond. We had him on, on Fat Man on Beyond. the first show that we used to shoot before we had the bar. Before we had a bar. And, uh, and so I said, hey, buddy, let's go meet Nathan. He's like, really? It's like, yeah, your mom loves Nathan Feely and she'll be super jealous. Jellious? Jellious. Jellious. Your dad makes up all sorts of funny words on the show. English is a fluid language. <laughs> and so, uh, so we walk over, and I'm like, hey, Nathan. He's like, hey, Mark, how are you? He's like, yeah, Nathan, it's my son, Luke. And he kneels down, because he's at that point 11, mm-hmm. and he goes, Luke, I'm a really big fan of your dad's. And I was like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> that's pretty it's like, smooth. It's like, you did it. You win. I can never say a bad thing about that, man. Yeah, that's very smooth. That is a sm- and plus, he's Canadian, so it was sincere. Earnest as hell. <laughs> American says that, and kid's like, yeah, bullshit. Canadian says it, kid's like, I see it in your eyes. I know. I like the, the moose in the background. is like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Canadian flag waving. Um, well, this is, uh, I mean, honestly, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, I don't think my kid has ever come to... No, she's been here. To Fat Man Beyond? Yeah, I've seen her in, like, a booth in the back not paying attention. <laughs> I, I, honestly, you're thinking of my wife. No, I'm... <laughs> Because that sounds more like my wife. My kid actually pays attention. My wife is just like, who, him, whatever. <laughs> um, I don't think the kid has. I think the kid's been here like once or twice, but never during a show. Huh. Yeah. I'm sorry. So, no, no, don't be. Now I have something to throw in my kid's fucking face. <laughs> you know, Mark's kid came and watched the show. And he can't even drink. So he's just <laughs> hanging he out had to watch bar. that shit sober. <laughs> you can get drunk and watch your father. <laughs> Well, welcome. How's college? Great. Yeah, he doesn't want to be home. Is that right? Yeah, I like partying. Just like dad. <laughs> you're a party guy, too. When you go to, like, the, the San Diego Comic Con, you're the guy that, like, you're out every night. I, I am. I am. Yeah. But I'm not out like I used to be. No. Like, there's a version of Comic-Con where it was like, there's four parties tonight, I'm doing four parties tonight. All right. Now, there's 52-year-old Comic-Con, which is like, I'm going to be there from like 5.30 to 7. <laughs> yeah. And I'm done. I got to go put my knees to rest. And that's how college kids party, right? From 5.30 to 7 and shit? 
<laughs> the blue plate special at college. Five thirty at night till seven in the yeah. morning. Like I remember, I went to to visit his dorm room, uh, and I walk in, and the kitchen counter is just covered with bottles of alcohol. And I was like, "Is there like a vegetable anywhere in this apartment?" <laughs> like, well, vodka's made Some of potatoes. Some of them used to be, yeah. <laughs> Um, that's pretty awesome, man. Well, welcome. Uh, hopefully, uh, Dad makes you proud all night long. I, I, he will, because he makes all of us fucking proud. Um, if you're, yes. No, no pressure. No pressure whatsoever. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, how have you been? Other uh, than on your best behavior tonight. <laughs> best behavior. Uh, I'm good. I'm, I've, I've since recovered from my back issues. Yeah, good. Yeah. Fantastic. We were supposed to do this when? Uh, the 28th of November. Right, but we couldn't because the back thing. Because my back decided to be like, hey, bitch, you're 52 years old. Go down! And so I did. Um, and yeah, and it was, it was going to be my birthday show. That would have been fun. I know. Yeah. And we were like almost sold out and shit like I that. think we were. And JC was unhappy when I was like, man, I cannot, I can't, I can't, can you put me in the, in the, in the, like the pan truck and like tilt me up and yeah, strap like, me in? Yeah, he's like, can you fucking lecture me? Yeah. Just sans mask because it's not <laughs> that kind of show, but you can strap me to a gurney and make me vertical. I'll do it. He was like, no. What but, happens on a night like that where we had to cancel? People come to the bar. They're coming to the bar anyway, right? Hey, it's Banff Man, everybody. Give it up Banff. for Banff Man. Hey! Um, I have to refund 75 tickets oh, and shit. send an apology message to people. And inevitably, usually like two people show up and are like, What's going on? <laughs> They're like, I got the best seats in the house. <laughs> but the funny thing is, is when that happens, I'm not here either. So like the staff has to deal with it. Oh, shit. <laughs> so we, get, we all get off easy. They're the ones who have to handle that. See what you did. I know. I feel so bad. Mm-hmm. Next time I'll do a personal message. I'll do a cameo. And it's like, hey, guys, just, I'm smacked up on all kinds of drugs. And I can't be vertical now, but Sorry. You could have done the whole show like this. I know. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Oh, (laughs) all for you, JC. (laughs) So you can sell fucking blue milk. Speaking of which, can I have some blue milk? Bamf. Bamf Man's back, everybody. Can I brag about the newest addition to the bar? Fuck yeah. That's been added? So the in the corner, you can't see it on camera. Maybe if Andrew goes to this camera, you can kind of see it. Let's see. Can you see it? I like the well, We kind of have this. We have a moisture evaporator in the corner, yeah. right? Which is what people who live in the desert use to suck air, uh, water out of the air. And they use it to drink and do their crops. So... Last month, I took it apart, and it's now a water fountain. So our moisture evaporator works. So it's a self-serve water station if you want to. Cool. If you're you're here and you want to water, that is fucking so. very cool. You said the delivery of that. You're like our water works. <laughs> Was said in the way of somebody who expects to get laid off of that sort of thing. Um, how long did it take you to make that? Uh, well, somebody else made it for some uh, for a fan film and donated, but I think I I like three D printed the part, so it took like a week to like design and three D print and then solder it all together. Look at you, fucking creative man! You could be sitting on resting on your laurels with this place, but you're ever trying to improve. Give it up for JC, kids. <laughs> Bath man in his bar. Um, so what have you been up to? What have I been up to? I, uh, uh, well, I last, I, maybe the last, I mean, I, I talked about a few episodes ago. My wife shattered her hip. So for the better part of, uh, yeah, for those who came in late, uh, we uh, moved out of our house that we'd lived in for over 20 years, and we moved into a house in the valley, which I've talked about here on the show. I was like, hey, valley neighbor, welcome. We're going to have barbecues. We're going to play like, in the pool. I was like, this is going to be great. Four months later, we moved back to our old house. And now we're selling the house in the valley. It's up for sale right now. If you want to live in a house I lived in for four months, kids. Um, so we're back at uh, the house that we've been in uh, forever and stuff. It was tough to leave behind. And, and when we left, they fixed it all up. And we were like, this looks great. And suddenly we found, 
<laughs> fell in love with it. We were like in the Wall Street Journal, like when they're like, he's selling his fucking house. This is what it looks like and shit. And nine days after it went on sale, like we were like, take it, take it down. <laughs> And they're like, why? And we were like, we're, we want to live in it again. <laughs> Those pictures look really nice. And it was furniture that wasn't ours and shit. <laughs> we'll pay above asking. I know. When we moved back in, we're like, this looks nothing like the photos. Um, so we moved back in. A week of moving back, we had the same fucking moving company. And they were like, you could do it again four months from now? I was like, we might. Fuck you. We might. <laughs> My money. We're very fickle in our middle age. Um, so they moved us in over the course of five days. Four days I was there for it. And on Thursday night, I went and got on a flight to go to New Jersey uh, to do a thing at Smog Castle Cinemas, my movie theater. Uh, when I was uh, like one hour from my house, uh, my wife uh, stepped off of the one, there's a stair that goes up to the platform where our bed is in an alcove. It's not like it's on a platform in the middle of a room rotating or something like that. It's just in a, on a, a step up into an alcove where the bed is. Uh, I have slipped on it many times and shit, and I got a bruised ass for like six months at one point. She split her chin at one point. Uh, this was like the worst it's ever been. She went to turn the light off and then stepped on the step, which literally I just did this evening as well. Half of my foot was on the step, and I was wearing a slipper with grips, and still it slipped off. And my wife was on the couch, who lived through this exact same experience painfully and had like fucking you know, flashbacks to her moment and shit like that. She fell... And my wife has very pronounced hips. Um, they're like handlebars. Um, I'm glad you said it. I had to, yeah. <laughs> um, they, she landed in such a way that her top of her leg, they call it the hip, but it's the top of the leg. It is the hip, but it's really the top of the leg. Top of the leg shattered into her pelvis and into her groin shattered the top of her leg, her hip, her hip shattered, top of her hip shattered. But to me, the hip was the pelvis. And then I learned something in all this, painfully on my wife's behalf, but I learned without the pain. The hip is just the top of the leg when it connects to the pelvis. That's what creates the hip. So I mean, this good body her, didn't teach you this shit? Like, no. The um, leg bone connected to the thigh bone connected no. to the hip bone I never to followed the... that song. It was too complicated. <laughs> but essentially what they did to replace the hip is they replaced the top of the leg. So the ball that goes to the top of the leg that goes into the socket, yeah, that's does. all titanium now. So she had, you know, it was like 26 hours after she fell. Some people get hip surgery in their 70s. She's 52 completely unprepared like wasn't like oh maybe i should get my hip done like sh it fell shattered she was like i've had a child so i know what fucking pain is i had no idea this was like unbelievably bad and shit um so she came home for the last six weeks i've been like playing nursemaid and stuff like that uh the good news is she six weeks after like the accident and it was bad like she was by herself in the house except with the dogs uh the house was locked double bolted from inside when the paramedics came, they came with the fire department and shit like that. Uh, she's like, you can't get in, even if I give you the door code, because it's double bolted. And I'm like, well, your windows are open. We'll send up the cherry picker. And they send up the ladder with the firemen climbing up. And all of a sudden, the two German shepherds we have are like, this is the moment we've been waiting for. <laughs> and they're like, intruder, blah, 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 blah. And the fireman was like, I can't go near that shit. So uh, fucking Austin Harley's boyfriend had to break in, go open the front door, let them in. Six fucking paramedics had to cut her clothes off. I was like, what? why'd they cut your clothes off? She's like, my leg wouldn't work at all and shit. So in order to fucking get me on the stretcher, they had to take my fucking gear off and shit. Um, six people to get her downstairs. She was in absolute fucking misery and agony and shit. Happy to report six weeks later, I just left this motherfucker walking around no cane whatsoever. She went from a walker to a wheeler to a cane, nothing. So orthopedics man I don't know about anything else uh, two things like I've got experience with right like I had a heart attack mm -hmm. so I know like uh, cardiovascular medicine is fantastic they saved my life I probably should be dead um, orthopedics I now have experience with because of her it's fucking nuts dude they like replace she's got like a robot you know not a robotic because they AI She's got AI hips. hips. She's got some fucking. You went on strike against AI hips, my friend. That's right. I should tell her. I was like, we struck against you. You're part of the problem. Um, it's crazy, man, how fast you can heal from that. Like, I would, it, it would seem like something like, oh my God, you're going to be off your feet for like six months. 
and there she is walking around. So I've been with her most of the time, but last week I got to break away because it was my mother's 78th birthday. Ooh. So me and my mom, uh, me and Harley went down to see my mom. Jen couldn't fly it. Uh, we went down, saw mom, hung out with mom, and mom wanted to go to Disney World, so we went to Disney World. And I rode two rides that I hadn't ridden before that are fairly new. One is the, the um, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. Mm -hmm. Do they have that in Disneyland, or is yeah. it just there? Do they? No. I don't Bam. It, they have a Guardians of the Galaxy thing here, but it's not. Well, the Guardians of the Galaxy thing here they have is Tower is of Terror. It's a drop, yeah. It's, it's just rethemed Tower of Terror. Yes. And it's fun and it's cool, but yeah. This is a completely different fucking ride. It's like a roller coaster, a dark ride indoors, but with like tons of footage and new stuff. Glenn Close opens the ride because it takes place on Xandar. And all of the Guardians of the Galaxy are there. And, and the, the only one, it, the, I don't know if Bradley Cooper did his voice for Rocket. Everyone else was who they were and shit. I mean, maybe, so maybe was, it, was it like Dom DeLuise? Like, was it like the, <laughs> yeah. the least rocket voice it ever? It was Carrot Head, oddly <laughs> enough. Uh, Hello! It, it didn't quite sound like him, but the ride is fucking nuts, and it's a quasi-sequel to, like, the second Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm. Um, uh, worth, worth the price of admission. That was very, very cool. And then I rode the Tron ride, which is pretty dope as well. It's like a roller coaster, light cycle, and you ride like on your stomach as if you're riding a light cycle and stuff. Um, when I got on a ride, they were like, you got to take your hat off, put it in the, there's a bin in the front. And I was like, all right, and I took my hat off. And, and then once the ride took off, I was like, fuck that, I'm a grown ass man. And I put my hat back on and shit. And I tightened it one more notch, because I was like, you know. Oh yeah, secure. This will be fucking good. This fucking thing took off, and I felt that hat starting to go, and I was like, no! And so the whole ride, I'm this. It's one of those fucking photos they take. Because at a certain point, I was like, oh shit, if my hat falls off, it falls on the track, maybe somebody derails, and it fucking turns the ride off for an hour, you know? And maybe somebody gets killed as well. Yes, they call, um, it, they, they call it the hat trick. But I was, yes, it could be the hat trick. So uh, there was this moment, like a grown-up moment I never would have as a child. There's a 53-year-old man, as this ride is like whipping you around like 120 miles per hour, and I'm holding on to my hat for dear life. I had this fucking thought ran through my head. I was like, maybe sometimes, sometimes, they know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know who they is, but in this instance, it was the park. It was right. like, take your fucking hat off. I was like, no. Well, I did at first. I, was too, I wasn't fucking, I was too chicken to say no. I was like, I will. And then once they were gone, I was like, fuck you, and put it back on. <laughs> but then fucking once shit was going south, I was like, I should have listened. And it was like a, something out of the Bible, like one of the morality tales and shit. Nine anyway. people were killed by Kevin Smith's hat. <laughs> I know. Because that's the thing. It's like, they're like, what caused the accident? Yeah. They're like, this black hat, <laughs> worn backwards. The brim of it just slicing necks as a <laughs> guillotine to the air. Whose hat could it be? They're like, he wrote his name in it. Kevin Smith. I'm like, fuck. Um, worth going on that ride. <laughs> but don't wear your hat. Yeah. And um, what else did I do? I have a question, though. Fire away. Um, why... Do you still have that bed on a stair? It's <laughs> an excellent fucking question. Like, you've all tripped on it yes. multiple times. Yes. One person completely fucked up one side of their body. Yes. And you Went almost tripped something. on it today. Yes. You're like, keep it on that lift. It's fine. Because if we took the bed off of it, what would go up there? It'd be this weird little alcove that, like, people are like, don't go up there. It's haunted. <laughs> You know, and the wife won't let me do it. When we got back from the, when she was getting out of the hospital, I was like, I'm taking the bed off that one step and putting it in the middle of the room. Mm. That way you don't have to climb up and shit like that. And she was like, no. She slept on the couch for like five fucking weeks mm -hmm. rather than do that one step up to the bed or rather than do the sensible thing, let me take the bed down below. And she, she got very specific ideas about where things belong in that house. And you'd imagine she'd be mad at the house because I sure would have been. If I was laying in the fucking hospital, I'd be like, fuck that cursed house. <laughs> Back to the valley. Totally. That's what I, but <laughs> I said to her, man, I was like, how you feel? And she was like, it's not the house's fault. But I was like, if this had happened in the valley, I'd never hear the end of it. She, you moved me to the fucking valley and destroyed my hip. But she won't say a bad word about the house. I mean, She's this just is like, like, nope, it's my fault and I'll learn from this. 
This is like some, it's like Siegfried and Roy, right? Like, we got these tigers. We love these tigers. Tigers are the best. Roy gets eaten by a tiger. <laughs> Siegfried's like, you know what? I still love these tigers. Get rid of the fucking tigers, man. I'm going to run that by her when I get home. Like, Mark says you're like Siegfried and Roy. <laughs> the bed is your tiger, and you <laughs> can't not be with a tiger. It's like I fell down a flight of steps. Should we not put the bed upstairs? No. I like a challenge. You're, you're a married man. Sometimes you just can't fight City Hall, man. Sometimes, sometimes it's best just to be like, it's your world. I'm just living it. I'm just a squirrel trying to get a nut. But the next time you fall down this lot of steps, just, <laughs> I'm going to laugh with every time you go down. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> this is on you now. I mean, that's, yeah, she won't see it that way. No, of course she not. She loves that house. Uh, and I do too, don't get me wrong. It, like when I left it, part of the reason I went back is like I missed it. Like we had very high ceilings and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And we moved to a house with like ceilings that were normal size. And I felt, I felt like a hobbit. <laughs> you know, my other house, I felt small. And then in the new house, I felt You felt big? big? Yeah, yeah. And I don't want to feel big? No, I like feeling small. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, that's what I did. And then the rest of the time, um, let me see. We did a, a pickup for our flick, something we couldn't shoot in Jersey back when we shot it. We had to wait till we shot it out here. Um, and that was a lot of fucking fun because it involved some green screen and shit and space and Flash Gordon. It was, it was, space. Yeah, it was fun. It was, it was kind of cool. Um, so I did that. Um, you know, I don't know. I, like, I, I guess that's it. I've just been around the house. I've been working on um, not just finishing up the movie, but working on the next one. I'm writing, I didn't think I would do it for a long time, but I, I had a, an idea and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna fucking follow this and see where it leads. And it's led to something I really fucking enjoy. Um, I'm writing, you know. Are you supposed to say anything? Yeah, I can, it's not for anybody. It's for okay. But, and it's not like Just surprising. Nobody's gonna be like, holy fuck, I'm writing another James Island Bob movie. Um, not surprising, it's what I do, I guess. But I honestly didn't think I'd do it for, like we had a plan to do like the third Jane Tom Bob movie when Jay's daughter, Logan, was 18. Because mm. then she could play Harley's daughter in the movie. Jay, Harley played Jay's daughter in Jay and Silent Bob reboot. So Logan would play Jay's granddaughter and we thought that'd be fucked up. The multiverse of madness. Exactly. Um, but, you know, Muse was just like, so I gotta wait fucking 10 years to do another movie? Um, and you know, I was like, well, I guess you're right. And so I started thinking about this thing and started writing it and I fucking absolutely love it. And it's, I'm writing it in the way that I wrote Red State. Um, in as much as, not that it's gonna be nearly as good, but anytime I know where the movie's going, that means the audience knows where the movie's going. And since it's a Jay and Silent Bob movie and I don't know, the 18th, Probably the audience knows where a lot of it's going to go. Every time I feel that way, I just fucking turn the tables and write something completely different. Every time I know what the punchline is, I'm forcing myself to find a different punchline, undercut it and stuff. So I'm using it as an exercise to kind of sharpen the comedic knives, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been having a fucking blast doing it. So next year, 2024, is the 30th anniversary of Jay and Silent Bob. Because yeah. um, it's also the 30th anniversary of Clerks. Yeah. But I don't own Clerks. <laughs> I own Jay and Silent Bob. So we'll be celebrating the 30th anniversary of Jay and Silent Bob with nice mentions to Clerks, of course. Um, so it could be a good time to shoot, shoot the flick. And it's like, this is the best thing I could say about it. It would work even if it wasn't Jay and Silent Bob. Like, it's just a movie. It's like a comedy movie and shit. And I love what we just did with the 430 movie, and it's an insanely sweet film. Um, and it's got some funny stuff in it, but this is definitely like more of what I have done historically and whatnot. So I've been having a fucking blast doing that. Um, that's where I've been. What have you been? Uh, You've been writing at all? I've been writing. I've been writing. Like when, when the strike ended and Hollywood kind of went back to work, specifically when the actor strike ended, and it was like, Great, let's go make stuff. Let's start buying stuff. Let's start doing stuff. A lot of projects that had been kind of on pause mm. for most of the year became unpaused. Right. 
And so lots of people began expecting things and asking for things, and so it's been a couple months of hopefully delivering on that stuff. Um, I can't talk about any of it because of course I can't. I can't talk about, I went on a tour of Sideshow Collectibles. Have you ever been out to Sideshow? Yes. Yo. That's where you want to die and be buried, right? You guys, it's so great. Yeah. Like, my, I had lots of favorite parts. All of it was like, I need a bigger house. Maybe I'll buy your house in the valley just for all the toys <laughs> that I'm going to get from Sideshow. I bet you I can get you a real good deal. <laughs> it's real sweet. Um, and one of the things that I, that I did manage to get from them is somewhere back here um, that we're giving away tonight as part of our Q&A prizes is, a, is a, a limited sideshow collectible jammy jam that Andrew probably has buried somewhere. To your left, he said. Ah! Thank you. <laughs> Bam. Um, Hey, Bam fans, back everybody. So, so I have been to Sideshow, mm -hmm. and they took me to the like store where you can get like a sweatshirt or a T-shirt or a book. Did you get like something special? It all depends on who you go with. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what became clear to me. My favorite part though is we're walking around Sideshow, and there's like toys everywhere, statues everywhere, and all of it's cool. Mm. And then there's like a staircase going from one floor to another floor. And in the back is just like a, like a little bookshelf. And like nothing's lit up, nothing's fancy. It's just like extra dolls and whatever. And in the back, unlit, like buried in shadow, is the, uh, is the, the Cara Dune figure from The Mandalorian, the Gina Carano figure. And I was like... Did that ever... I'm sure they sold it. They made it. But like, let this be a warning to you. <laughs> this is what happens when you run afoul of Lucasfilm. We bury you in the corner. You get moved to the back. Yeah. I was like, oh, they should walk every new actor through here and be like, don't do that. <laughs> here there be monsters. Um, yeah, that place is pretty magnificent. Yeah. Especially because they've got, you know, the fucking the sculptures that you can buy and put on a table. And then they have life-size shit where you're like. And I asked him, I was like, What's th how, what sells more? Is it the statues that are super cool or the life-size stuff? It's like life-size stuff. Like by a factor of three or four. We sell right? more of these than we do of the normal stuff. I was like, how? Who? Who's buying stuff? He's Comic like, book stores? Saudi princes. <laughs> He's like, we shipped 40 stormtroopers to a mall opening in Abu Dhabi. I was like, damn. Wow. And a Darth Vader and some uh, Fett and a this. He's like, we have the, it's like a chess set of life-size Imperial figures in a mall in Abu Dhabi. It's oil money. I was going to say, Bam. I feel poor. Yes. I was going to say, I've said this. I, I don't even I'm have right. one large fucking thing. <laughs> I mean, I got Iron Bob, but that's because I made a fucking whole ass movie to get it and shit. But like, I don't have like a huge Iron Man or something like that. And how many they got? They got, they, what, 40 stormtroopers? Uh, I have a... Uh, Hold on, I'm having an existential crisis. <laughs> What has it all been for? Yeah, I'm like, what am I spending my money on if I don't have at least a big Iron Man? And now, like, my kid doesn't live there and shit, and, like, my, my wife's parents who lived with us, like, for 20 years, they don't live there, so there's so much room in the house. And I know I didn't make that movie, but I think I would, I think I would like a giant Iron Man. How, how much money have you got? I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> so who did you go with? <laughs> oh. oh. I'll, I'll tell you a thing about a thing. Yeah? Uh, but I, what I'm curious about is exactly how much room you now have in the house and if you might be willing to accommodate a family of four. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because I will get rid of my house in the valley and move in with you and it'll be like film camp all day long. Since the kid doesn't live there anymore and, and Jen's parents moved out, like we did have extra rooms and at one point I was like, you know, like... <laughs> We could air be, and she's like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> she was like, no, we won't be doing that. And I was like, why? She's like, because I listen to a lot of crime podcasts. <laughs> Gwyneth Paltrow does it, though, right? That's what I I literally said the same thing. I was like, Gwyneth Paltrow does it. And she was just like, uh-huh. Gwyneth Paltrow does a lot of shit. You want to do what she does all the time? Where's your vagina candle? And I was like, fair enough. <laughs> And then I walked away muttering, where's your vagina candle? <laughs> she didn't hear me, so it was cool. <laughs> yes, it's fine. And I said, <laughs> <Yeah>. bitch. 
<laughs> Not even in a dream. <laughs> Over to you. Bam, man, you've wanted to say something. Oh, I was going to say, I have a um, life-size figure that I bought for myself on my 39th birthday. Is it a Star Wars thing? It's uh, a Jessica life- Rabbit. It is a life-size Jar Jar Binks yeah. that that was in my dining room. I I know it's well. No, my question is why? No, I'm saying why? Oh. Why do you want go back where you were? Why isn't it here? Uh, because people fuck with it. <laughs> I guess is that what it comes down to? You're like I don't want them touching my Jar Jar. Yeah, it's mint. <laughs> It, so it's been in our dining room for four years. Yeah. And Jen was finally like, can we, can we get that out of the dining room before Christmas? And yeah, there it is. Andrew put it up. That's a Jar Jar cake for our fourth birthday at Scum and Villainy and my life-size Jar Jar in my dining room. Uh, so wait, your wife's like, get it out of here. So I put it out in my office and... Uh, and Jocelyn came out and was like, where is Jar Jar? And was so upset. Because Jocelyn, for those at home who are is my closely, three-year-old. Is his three-year-old. And so she, she was pissed. Because it's been there her whole life. Right. And so I said to Jen, I was like... The kids are real good about, you know, fucking taking things away. I was like, uh, I was like, I feel like we've had dinner as a family of four... <laughs> for the last three years and now we're a family of three <laughs> with one and member ostracized to a dark office and Jen was like I hate to admit it but yeah so it went back into the room no it's still in my office she didn't care that much <laughs> bring it here people it's Hollywood people like people will anything that's touchable that's why, like, every cool thing we have... But wait, have, I'm, I'm sorry. Is this, was this not an ironic gift to oneself? Like, nobody buys a Jar Jar going, I literally love it. I, I mean, I did do a two-hour podcast on why Jar Jar is the best character in Star Wars. Is he really your favorite? It started off as ironically my favorite. <laughs> yes. But, like, as I went deeper and deeper into it, it he kind of became my favorite. It, it, oh my god, this is like 80s teen comedy Can't Buy Me Love. They, they like eat, where at first you're like, this is a fucking joke, and now you're like, I do love him. The, the easiest way to describe it is, it's like, as a Star Wars fan, like, when I loved Star Wars, everybody hated Star Wars. And now, everybody loves Star Wars. Well, well they did. Yeah. For a pre-2015. <laughs> yeah. And... I was just like, what's the thing that I could do that just shows how extreme my Star Wars fandom is? So I just went deep into Jar Jar and like the psychology of Jar Jar and the whole thing. And, and, and I, yeah, what started as irony <laughs> That'll just became show the like, world. <laughs> yeah, just became like my thing. Uh, can I? Look at that. Well, before you buy your next drink, know that a portion of it, the proceeds, probably go buy some Jar Jar shit. <laughs> You just don't bring it here because you don't want somebody to accidentally fuck Jar Jar Binks in your bar. Sounds life size, right? right? I mean, it's other Hollywood. than you, like you want to be. Let's the be soul, honest too. Right. By process of elimination, this world of possibilities, somebody has fucked a Jar Jar statue. And let's be honest, it's probably because they drilled their own hole. And let's Shit. be honest, it's probably you. <laughs> What you doing in the workshop, honey? Nothing. Yeah. Woo! I don't want to eat in the same room with that thing that you fuck. <laughs> Get it in your office. <laughs> oh, but I honey, will. I love it. <laughs> anyway, uh, should we talk about a sponsor? For this <laughs> yeah. <episode? laughs> what a great time. Let's give win. thanks to those who uh, give us uh, yeah. love so we do the show. They're gonna love this. Uh, tonight's episode is brought to you by the good people at Fume. Oh, let me tell you something, man. I do like, uh, I, I legit love the people at Fume. They sent me a Fume, yeah. and they sent me lavender. Oh, Stick it a Fume. No. Fume is not even a smoking device. It's like, a, how do they describe it? It's a sucking device. No smoke comes out of it, but it's like having a thing in your a mouth. Sucking device? Hell you yes. got to pay more for that. Yes. 
Uh, um, um, it, it's, it's, it's coming through now. Yeah, it's coming through now. Uh, okay, intro. Be smart, don't start, kick the habit, and put it out before it puts you out. All phrases we've heard a thousand times, yet we still continue to do bad habits. Uh, personal struggle. Any bad habit that's hard can't be smoking or vaping to kick the story. Uh, should I not be reading the instructions? <laughs> yeah, probably, the not especially not the parenthetical stuff. It's okay. like, do not read this Don't out say loud. anything about this. Our Sparks of Fume is on a mission to accelerate humanity's breakup from the bad habits that consume far too many of us. Fume is a natural diffusive device. There you go. A natural diffusive device. That just rolls off the tongue. It really does. That uses plants and behavioral science to help you trade out your negative habit for a positive one. Fume is not a vape. No. It is a non-electronic device designed to transform yeah. your negative habits. I wonder if you could use this on a plane. Because it's not a vape and it, there's no electronic parts. I'd like to see you try. And be right next to you with my camera out. It, it, might, it might be worth a shot because it's not like I've, I've in order to you open it up and you load in this like uh, stick. That's call it a core. The core. Is that what they call mm -hmm. it? But it's like a little stick that goes inside and then you close it and then you just breathe. So the mint one is just like you're sucking like, gu you know, fucking winter fresh gum all the time. <laughs> Inhale it and you're like, ah, it's crisp. But there's nothing comes out. No. It's uh, a diffusive it, advice. Instead of pods filled with potentially harmful chemicals like a vape, Nothing. fume uses cores infused with plants like peppermint and cinnamon and lavender yeah. for delicious natural flavors. And you know I love lavender. Hell yeah. I'm more than Prince. Uh, fume's new version 2 model is snappy and tactile. With an adjustable airflow dial and a magnetic end cap, your fingers will that always tracks. have... That's legit true. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Good ball. Keep Thank on. you. Your fingers will always have something to do. Always. Uh, talk about the look, feel, and taste. Uh, do you want to talk about the Fantastic. look, feel, and taste? Fantastic. Honestly, it's, it, it really is. Like, um, it, the, the feel of the actual device is wood, and it's got metal pieces to it and stuff. But it's got the weight of, you know, those of us who've had a habit, or, you know, sometimes people talk about just wanting to have a thing in your hands. Well, this takes care of that. Mm -hmm. And then as you suck in, it's pleasant, it tastes good, and it smells nice and shit. Um, but there is no smoke, no vapor, or anything like that. I wonder if it could be used on a plane. It's like literally like smoking a straw. So it's like... Like a candy cigarette? I think even that might have more harmful fucking chemicals <laughs> yeah. and additives. This is all natural and stuff. Uh, the easiest way to stop a bad habit is to switch to a positive one, and fume is designed perfectly to do just that. It's Fume's goal to make switching easy and even enjoyable. They have thousands of five-star reviews from people just like you who've successfully switched when other solutions didn't work. I can see it. Yeah? I can see them having a lot of great Yeah? Ideas. Yes. Head to tryfume, T-R-Y-F-U-M, dot com and use code FATMAN to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. Journey Pack comes with three unique flavors and the new version 2 Fume to help kickstart your positive habits. That's what they sent me, the version 2 Fume. Yeah, it's clicky clicky. Yeah. Uh, that's tryfum.com and use code FATMAN to save an additional 10% off on your order today. And we thank the good folks at Fume for sponsoring this final episode of 2023. Give it up for the good folks at Fume. We did it. Uh, can I uh, sell some things too? Sure, before we get into the top tens and the news and Q's and A's. We got graphics. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll start with some Smodcastle stuff. Kids, uh, I've been away from Smodcastle since November uh, 3rd. We had an event there, and that, that's when Jen shattered her hip, and so I haven't been able to go back for anything. So we've got four events coming up in January if you're on the East Coast. Um, first up is uh, Smokshin, which is uh, something we do before every show that I'm at at Smokshin, where we auction off props and shit like that and sign things from people who've been there, um, posters and stuff like Jason Lee's been there and stuff, Joey Adams, so they sign stuff. We auction that off. Uh, we're doing a whole fucking show because people, sometimes the auction that we do before <coughs> the movie, you've been there for, I have. for Fat Man Beyond, sometimes goes like fucking, the longest one was three hours long. And the audience is like, when are we watching the movie? <laughs> it's like, after this is done. So a lot of people are like, why don't you do your own fucking auction show? It's like, I will. So the whole show is nothing but fucking auction and stuff. That's happening on June 6th. 
January. January 6th. 6th. Thank you. I knew something was wrong about that. You the, heard it in my voice. I'm like, the other June 6th. Yes. Uh, Wait, you're having it on January 6th? Happy anniversary, everybody. I guess. Come storm the castle and I buy guess. my... Storm the Smod Castle. That's right. And buy my... Smod sh- Castle Insurrection. Um, <laughs> well, it's not a holiday we got to keep sacred or anything. And, and it's the kind of thing we want to, like, fucking put behind us and, I like, mean, I'm not pretty, celebrate in that I'm way. pretty sure the Catholic Church celebrates, like, when did Jesus die? Well, this, January 6th is actually a, a, a Catholic holiday. It's Epiphany, Little Christmas, it's called. How weird. That, I just fucking pulled that from my Catholic training. <laughs> That's like when fucking Batman loses his mind and becomes the Batman of Zura and Ra and shit. Just like the programming. He's like, if I'm ever taken over, a fucking program kicks in where I can be Batman even if I fucking have lost my mind. That's what the Catholics did to me. They did. So even though I haven't been in fucking church for fucking years, I was able to pull that shit just That's like That's some that. Razal Ghul shit. It's that like, really is. Trust man. your training, Master Bruce. Truly. I might be able to do all the stations of the cross from memory. Go! Nope. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can't fucking remember a one. I know it doesn't work out well for Jesus. Yeah, Dominic um, Sanders will be all right. Kind of like the Titanic. Um, all right, so January 6th. Is no Good longer going to be remember, remembered for that stuff. Nope. It's going to be remembered as the day of Smokshin. Also, the day of the 15th anniversary screening of Zach and Mary Make a Porno. Yeah. Um, that screening is nearly almost sold out already, kids. Those tickets are on sale right now at smogcastlecinemas.com. Then, I come back two weeks later uh, to do two uh, things. Uh, and one is the uh, second time we've done it. Last year, we did a, an event called Clerks Open All Night. Where you know you come at ten o'clock at night, we lock you in. You sleep at the theater. Uh, you spend the night with me, and we watch all the Clerks movies, the entire Clerks saga and shit. A pedophile's dream. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Let's just lock you in the theater, buddy. You can't leave. We're all fucking grown ups. There's no children there. You, you're the only one who brings a child to a bar. He's of majority. Um, yes, it's not a pedophile thing at all, dude. Fucking the internet. <laughs> I'm selling shit here, man. They get man. fucking weird. Um, it's just us sitting around watching Clerks. And we had a great time doing it uh, last year. Uh, we're doing it again. So Clerks Open on Night 2 happens on Janu- January 20th. Uh, that is also half sold out at this point, so get your tickets fast. And then I think the day after that, we're doing Batman Returns. Showing Batman Returns. Uh, they wouldn't let us show it. Before the Flash came out, now they're like, "You can show it, whatever you want." Yeah, didn't you want to show Batman? Go ahead, show the. Can you show the Flash as well? All the Batmans. Um, always a good time to be had at Smod Castle, kids. Uh, there, you got that clip, Andrew, Russo brothers clip. Russos. Yes, I do. All right, so this is like the last time I was at Smod Castle. We did this thing uh, uh, on November third, where the Russo brothers came to Smack Castle, and I got to interview him. We shot the whole thing. Uh, but uh, this is a little piece that's kind of re- re- uh, very relevant to our crowd, I guess. Remember, in a world, you know, the, the kerfuffle about the <laughs> dogs? Box office. Yes. And, yeah. Um, he, uh, they address it, and uh, I've, I've pulled this clip to show here. Uh, in, in a world oh, where Arrested Development can trace its origins back to Man Bites Dog, um, you guys have... You're wearing the same you're very schooled. <laughs> In your subject matter. What a horrible um, fashion. Yeah, we watched a lot of this shit growing up. I mean, we were just fanatics. Thing. I mean, I watched, you know, it was like are we, are we Dobie Gillis to is in there it? too, and so is Lost in Space. And, what know, they're saying is and I would Gilligan's imagine Island. And many Gilligan. amongst your influences. You're like, many I Scorsese know, films right? Well. I'm many also, Scorsese like, yeah, films. <laughs> yeah. Hear that in a um, who, who doesn't? Every uh, Scorsese. Are, they, are we yes. not here? Everybody, uh, for the record, oh, everybody shit. loves Spartan Scorsese. All right, yes, so everybody go back to the beginning. one of the reasons. In a world where Arrested Development can trace its origins back. To- hey. <laughs> well, that went great. Doesn't that make you want to go to Smog Castle? Of course it does. Uh, we ready to try again, Andrew? To be fair, it was playing the audio on the stream. That's it's just figured, not in the room. We figured, but everyone in the room, it was such an awkward sit for a minute. <laughs> They were just looking at us, and we had no answers for them. Um, all right, Andrew, take it away. Show them. Man bites dog. Um, you guys have you're very schooled in your subject matter. Um, yeah, we watched fans. a lot of shit growing up. I mean, we were just 
fanatics. I mean, I want, you know, it was like Dobie Gillis is in there too, and so is Lost in Space, and you know. And I would Gilligan's imagine Island and many, amongst your influences, many Scorsese films as well. Ma many Scorsese oh, yeah. films. Um, who, who doesn't? Every love Scorsese. Scorsese. Yes. Uh, every, uh, for the record, everybody loves Martin Scorsese. Yes, everybody does. He's one of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons that we're sitting up here, right, is the, the influence of his movies. And, you know, it's interesting because, uh, uh, you know, my daughter runs my social media account the way his daughter runs his social media account. And we saw this cute video he did with his dog, and we happened to have an identical dog. Both was, schnauzers. Yeah, they're both schnauzers, and I thought, this is hilarious. This could be really cute. And his video uh, is him. His, his video is him talking to his dog. He's coaching it through, uh, you know, like he's, he's like it's going to do a, a part for him. And his dog's name is? His dog's name is Oscar. Uh, and... My daughter was like, that's funny. She was like, what if our dog's name was box office? And I went, oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's cute. Uh, and then, you know, we posted it on TikTok like a week. We do a bunch of TikTok videos together. It's mm. like how I stay connected to my daughter. Um, you know, she has all these funny ideas, and we're trying all this shit all the time. And we posted it, and then, like, people discovered it like a week after we posted it. <laughs> So you and posted it, and you're like, that was fun. That was Did cute. something with the kid. Funny. Life like, is good. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I think people conflated the timing of when they discovered it with his movie, which was not the intention. This was just like a broad appeal joke, you know? It's like, he's got a funny dog named Oscar. I've got a, a little schnauzer named Box Office. And, you know, shit storm ensues. Yeah, it, um, it wasn't, I, I mean, I, when I saw it, I wasn't like, oh, he got him. He fucking yeah. sure got him. I was like, oh, that's adorable and shit. Yeah. The internet, on the other hand, had different ideas. They did. I got interneted. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they interneted all over your face, oh, neck, and chest. Did. This is brought to you by thatkevinsmithclub.com. That's right, man. If you can't get enough of the sound of my voice... <laughs> They're already hearing too much of me. Uh, I'll tell you what, as Mark pointed out, I'm dressed the exact same. <laughs> it's all right. Um, come on out to Smog Castle Cinemas, kids. Tickets available right now at SmogCastleCinemas.com. Uh, can you throw up the comic book covers, Andrew? Uh, Quick Stops, Volume 2, Number 1 came out this week. Cool, cool. <laughs> And uh, three different covers, uh, kids. That one by Ahmed, that one by uh, Chogren, and then uh, that one by our very own Dark Nate. Oh. Nate Gonzalez did that cover. Looks like The Watchmen. Uh, this is my movie secret origin story. The first round of Quick Stops was all issues about the characters, various characters in the Viewers universe. Uh, this time around, it's just the secret origin story of movie The Golden Calf. And it, it is perhaps the most salacious thing I've ever written in my life. It That's saying something. Yeah, I mean, truly. It should, of course, you know, since it's about a kid's cow, be very simple and innocent, but it's anything but. Uh, and, um, and Ahmed did such a great job drawing it. So that is available right now at your local comic shop or Jane Silent Bob's Secret Stash, which is celebrating coming up on its 27th year in business as a brick and mortar. Hot damn. Uh, thank you. They're on the other side of the country, so they can't hear you, but I appreciate it. Um, and I think that's all I got, man. Um, is Shannon here? Jump on. Okay, let's talk to Shannon real quick. Uh, Andrew, throw up a pi picture of the sneaks. Sneakers? Yeah. Jump over there. They can't see you unless they go over there. See those sneakers? So I got a bunch of custom vans. Um, and I got, I started doing this, started wearing them, uh, because this, a lovely girl came up to me after I did a thing at a comic book store in the valley. And, uh, after the show, she said, your shoes are terrible, wear these. <laughs> and she gave me a pair of movies vans. Uh, her name on Instagram is one crafty punk, as in the number one. Uh, but we know her, Shannon. Give it up for Shannon, everybody. Say hi. <laughs> Put the, put the camera on her, Andrew, <laughs> on Shannon. I know. <laughs> there you go. There's Shannon, everybody, at home. Thank you. 
Um, to everyone, every time I wear these sneakers or any, and I've got about eight pair that Shannon did, um, people are always like, ooh, fuck, where'd you get them? And I try to explain and stuff, and, and that's when they're like, wait, I gotta fucking go find this person on Instagram. Yeah. You paint sneakers? Yes. Um, how long have you been doing it? Probably 10, 12 years. And from scratch, no pattern? Sometimes I'll give myself like a guide or a little bit of a pattern or kind of like a stencil, but right. mostly, yeah. What's I sketch out all my ideas like on Procreate and kind of piece together my layout and how I want to do it. And then what I do you got in that van's box? What's in the box? A new yeah. pair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Please, Gwyneth right. Paltrow's head? No. Oh. oh, does the other one say rats? Oh, oh the other one says rats. Oh. Hold that shit up. JC, put that, put that up in that camera, man. Oh, that's fresh. There you go. Look at this shit, kids. So those ones I knew you weren't expecting and had not requested, but... He's coming. There you go. Look at that shit. <laughs> Gorgeous. How long it take you to do? A long time. I try not to keep track because I'll just make my brain um, spin, so but several hours. Hands down, beautiful work. I've, I, again, I've got, this will be, that'll be, are those for me? Yes. That's the ninth Aww. fucking pair I got. Yeah. Thank you Aww. so much. I did these Love wearing them when I'm at Spotcast. I wear them all the time. Here, I don't wear them because nobody sees my feet behind the bar. Uh, so I wear the Hoka's. You don't sure. wear them for me? You see them when you go to Smog Castle. When I'm at Smog Castle, yeah, these, I do. Yeah. people Ship see my feet right all Jersey. the time. <laughs> and I wear them all the time. Um, I would like to uh, purchase a pair of custom vans for <gasps> Mr. Bernard in here. For me? What would you put on a pair of sneakers? Merry Christmas, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, it feels like it should be Fat Man. You could you could totally take the family you can do beyond. That. beyond, or you could do a door in the distance, bro. I c I could. Yeah. Or you could do your what's the Mace Windu series called? You could do Mace. You yeah, could pick it's Star Wars. I'm not, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna <laughs> custom do somebody else's shit. That feels weird. Bug it if if Disney heard you'd be like, I don't want to buy Star Wars shit. Like, <laughs> cut it. Yeah. They'd be like, we're in trouble. <laughs> no, I think I think Fat Man. Yeah. That's the one. So you'll one. have a pair of Fat Men Beyond sneakers before I will? <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> and I will be the belle of the ball, That's sir. Fair, fair enough. Gift is a gift. Um, we will make it possible? happen, yes. You can make that happen? We'll shoot some sketches around and boop, boop, boop. you can finalize and let me know. If uh, anybody out there wants to hire you, uh, we run the potential of having you work for the next three years straight Definitely. by unleashing this information I'm to the world. I'm up for it. Um, where can they find you? On Instagram. At? One Crafty Punk. And is that where you... That's the best way to... The best place to do yeah. it? Do you Etsy as well? I tried, but... So Instagram is the way to go. It's flooded and they take too much money and I Excellent. take too long to paint, so... Uh, <laughs> kids, I, I can't say enough good things about the skips. If you're a Vans person, some people don't like wearing Vans. I love Vans. Um, I can do other shoes. You guys do you Jay, do other I can shoes? do Nikes. I just... The prep work on Nike and... Any leather is a lot more than these. I can just, yeah. I love but the vans. I can man. do purses, wallets. Do you really? Yeah. Do all that shit as yeah. well? Maybe these I'll are just, I'm a, a, I'm a shoe purse. junkie. I love my vans. So it was just like the merging of the two together makes sense to me. And it's just what I love. Done and done. Kids at home, go check out on Instagram one Crafty Punk, C R A F T Y P U N K. Yep. Give it up for Shannon, kid. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. That's awesome. I would put those on back here, but fucking it's so sticky back here. I'll, I'll grab, yeah, I'll tell you, I'm going to put them right on the fucking bar. So everybody can see them on the... Put them on the glass. <laughs> look at that shit. Give me that front shot. You look at that shit. This fucking symmetry. Get it right in the middle. Kubrickian nice. symmetry. There you go. It's been bugging me. I'm leaning toward you all night like I'm scared. I gotta learn to stay over here because look, that's a better shot. Like you're scared? Yeah, like this is... Look at that framing. It's terrible. Look at all that dead space. It's like... 
I mean, but over here, this makes more sense. But I like being near you, to be honest. I, I feel safer here amongst all these fucking people. If somebody yeah. makes a jump, you got my back. <laughs> yes. From over here, anything could happen. And shit. Be seconds before you could react. Um, okay. What, what should we, we do, do now? Uh, we have news. Yes. We have uh, my best of 2023. Um, where do you want to go first? Let's leave it up to the kids. Where do you guys want to go? News or best of? Best of. Best of. <laughs> well, that was a mistake. Yeah. How about Way this? Go. Uh, clap for news. Okay. Clap for best of. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mark Bernard uh, always puts together a list and says, hey, I'm putting together a list. Will you do it? And I'm like, all right. And then I never do. Um, <laughs> But thankfully, most of the stuff on his list I get to comment on. However, because I've also seen, however, there are things that Mark has put onto his list in the past which took me a little while to catch up to. <laughs> Case in point, a few months ago, I fucking wrote Mark out of the blue to be like, I just finally watched Train to Busan. <laughs> Didn't you talk about that nine years ago? You know, he was <laughs> like, yeah. And I was like, it's fucking amazing. He's like, I told you. <laughs> I told everybody. He really did. Um, so it's a list uh, that lets you look back at the year and go, oh, shit, I remember that, with some titles that will make you go, oh, I didn't even hear about that shit. So without further ado, summing up, are you calling it the best of 2023? I'm, I'm, I'm calling it the best of 2023 with some caveats. There you go, man. The Give it up for Mr. Mark Bernard and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the, the caveats are namely... Uh, for television, there's no returning shows. So we are not going to talk about The Bear as much as I love The Bear. We're not going to talk about... Which, by the way, I finally caught up with and absolutely Again, fucking Again, two years love. late. He's right. Two years <laughs> late. He's absolutely right. Two years ago, he said, you should watch The Bear. I was like, I will. And I did two years later. Yes. Um, when the rest of the world did. It's fantastic if you haven't seen it. It's um, glorious. So the, the Bear we won't hit. Fargo we won't talk about. For All Mankind, which I love. And if you're not watching, you 100% should. Fargo, you, this season's Fargo. This season's Fargo. With which, fucking John Hamm wearing nipple rings. Hell yeah. I can't and stop uh, jerking off to that show. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what's going on because the moment they show that, I'm like... <laughs> Do you see how violently that happened? I know. It's, you punished your John Hamm. I was, I was also going, this punched my John Hamm. <laughs> Uh, back to you. Uh, what We Do in the Shadows, we won't talk about. Harley Quinn, we won't talk about, despite the fact that all of them had great seasons. Yes. Uh, this is the new stuff. So, okay, fair enough. Everyone got that? I was going to re-explain it, but I think he did a great job. And also, because a movie isn't on this list doesn't mean that I, or isn't on the list, doesn't mean that I hated it. There's just some shit that I haven't seen. Fair enough. Like, I still haven't seen Killers of Flower Moon yet. I haven't seen Past Lives. I haven't seen... Like, there's a raft of Oscar movies that are still just beginning to come down the pike that I haven't seen. I haven't seen Wonka yet, so we're not talking about that. Right. Um, we do have some Wonka stuff to give away later on, thanks to our good friend Deacon, when we do our Q, uh, the Q&A part. Man. We are 4DXing Wonka? Yeah. Are they blasting candy up your ass? Yes. <laughs> you sit in the chair, and they just fill you full of fucking everlasting gobstoppers. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Um, so, yes. That is not in any way an indictment of the things we're not talking about. Fair enough. So many disclaimers. Just launch. All right. Honorable mentions. Okay. Stuff that did not crack the top ten. Fair enough. Monarch, Legacy of Monsters. You watched it and dig it? I'm caught up Kurt on Russell it. Kurt Russell and his kid. Wyatt and, uh, and Godzilla. Not sure if you're familiar with Godzilla. How often does, does Godzilla make an appearance per episode? Is what? there a monster per episode? Uh, there's a God, you get Godzilla once every like three episodes. Do you get anybody else? Uh, yeah. Other monsters? Yeah. But not like, I've, like there's I've, no Gamera, there's no Ghidra, there's no Mothra. You get like... Then there's no Kev. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I've made the mistake of saying on the show in the past that like, why do they ever show the human story? Just show me monsters beating each other up. And I was called like a heathen online. They're like, don't you fucking understand? The human story is what it's all about. Nobody wants to watch just monsters fighting. I disagree. Um, so I will say, I know the human part is important. Is this just the human part over and over again? Uh, it's, it, it's a bit of a, it's the mystery. It, it is the human part to a certain degree, but it is not quite the, the, there's another title we'll talk about later on, which is very much the human part, and it's phenomenal. But we'll get there. Okay. We'll get there. But this is more like, what if the X-Files also was about Godzilla? 
And like, that's also kind of cool. Does it pass the Godzilla Bechdel test? <laughs> in as much as, is there ever a conversation where people aren't talking about Godzilla? Because let's be honest, if Godzilla existed, that's all we'd fucking talk about. Uh, the, the Trump's not Godzilla. We all talk about it. So imagine if something that fucking huge could knock buildings over, had fucking atomic breath and shit like that. There wouldn't be, a, like, there would be no scenes in that show where people are like, how you doing, really? <laughs> people would be like, oh my God, isn't it amazing we haven't been killed by Godzilla yet? Uh, I'll say like three quarters of all the conversations are about Godzilla. Yes. And then there's a sort of relationship that's at the center of it about these two kids who discover that their father was leading two separate lives including with two separate women who are each of their mothers. And he was also an agent of Monarch, which seems to be the overarching organization that's investigating. Not hearing women. any Godzilla in any of this. <laughs> Sounds like human problems. I got those of my own. I just want to see giant things beating the shit out of each other. It's called escapism. No, I understand. Yes. It's important. And you like it. It's I got do an like honorable it. mention. Honorable mention. Watch when I watch it three years from now. I'll be like, Mark, have you ever seen Monarch? <laughs> it's worth an honorable mention. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the human part. Yeah. Uh, Beckham, the Netflix documentary about David Beckham. You did uh, give that high praise when we talked a it's, few weeks back. It's pretty extraordinary, especially because if you're a kid who spent any time at all in the 80s or 90s, and you will remember this person. And whether or not you remember him as a soccer player, football player, uh, as a sort of fashion model, as just a famous person at the height of fame. Mm. Um, the way they sort of dig into his life and excavate all of the drama underneath it and examine what fame actually meant in a place where you couldn't walk around and not be David Beckham. Like, and all of the attention that that gave. Like, he had to flee countries because there was too much heat on him. And so it's, it's an interesting examination into both sport and the, the abject insanity of being famous. Doesn't matter if you know a thing about... I could care football. less to a certain degree about football other than the Ted Lasso of football. Right. Um, but but it, it, it invests you in it in a way that happens quickly and effectively. Multi-episodes or like one, two? Four episodes. episodes. Fuck. Four one hours. Why does everything have to be so fucking long, man? Like they put up, what did I watch? Like fucking, oh, I watched Leave the World Behind. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at the running time, I was like, two hours and 20 minutes. What the fuck? But then at the end, I was like, it's over. But it no, was like, no, good though. it can't be over. Keep it going and shit. He kept that shit gripping for two hours and 23 minutes. So that's a bad example. Yeah. But everything is a series, man. Like, why, why can't they just tell this story in two fucking hours? I don't know, man. But it's really good. All right, fair enough. All right. Um, the Marvels. Yes. Loved it. Watched it. This, that was this year? That was, that was like three weeks ago. <laughs> oh, the Marvels. I thought you meant Ms. Marvel. Yeah, the Marvels. <laughs> that was this year. Uh, yeah, like it's, it is not the best Marvel movie ever. It is maybe in the top half of them, but it 100% it does what you want a movie to do. It gets in, it gets out, it makes you laugh. It makes you feel a thing about a thing. Like it's, and the cast is phenomenal. Like I don't know what more you wanted from a movie like this because for me it gave me everything I was looking for. It is, uh, you know, it's been the whipping boy or girl in this case for the last few months but I think Aquaman's about to be like, hold my beer. <laughs> glub glub. Yeah, I, I, they, they didn't do a premiere for Aquaman at all and they're not letting anybody, they're embargoing the reviews until the actual day it comes out. Never really a good sign. And I read one box office projection report that said it may not open as well as Blue Beetle did. Oh, damn. That's a sequel to a billion dollar grossing movie. Like, what the fuck happened, man? What happened this year? It's like we entered the upside down. Nobody gives a fuck about Marvel or Star Wars anymore. You and I, we're fucked. <laughs> this show, fucked, you know? We got to start talking about politics or something, man, because nobody dude, cares about fucking Star Wars and Marvel anymore. It can't be fucked. I'm getting shoes. <laughs> yeah, good point. We got to stay alive for one more season. I got to get the shoes. Um, yeah, man, the Marvels. God, that did just happen, didn't it? Uh, but worth, worth the honorable mention. You're absolutely Indeed. right. Indeed. Um, American fiction. Some of the people. <laughs> the makers uh, of American fiction, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed. Uh, they're, they're a bit whiter. What is it? 
American Fiction is a movie written and directed by Cord Jefferson, who, if you don't know the name, he's the guy who wrote the black and white episode of Watchmen, Nostalgia, and won an Emmy for it. Okay. Um, this is his writing directorial debut, starring Jeffrey Wright and Sterling K. Brown, and, uh, and who else is in it? Leslie Uggams. Um, Leslie Huggins. But it's, it's an adaptation about a novel. Jeffrey Wright is playing an author um, who is struggling with his identity as a, as a sort of black author in modern America who decides that rather than write scholarly works about you know, characters having their own existential crises, he's going to write the shittiest novel he possibly can, the most stereotypically black thing that anybody has ever written. And that becomes the book that everybody wants to buy. That becomes the book that becomes a runaway bestseller. And so it's all about sort of him synthesizing whatever version of himself can deal with being a sellout, but also does become a commentary on the industry that he's selling out to. Fuck. Um, what's it's the title? American Fiction. I mean, it doesn't really give you a hint of what's to come. Like, you're, you just did a better job of selling it than the title did. I mean, it's... Can <laughs> that be the title? Everything you just Everything said? Everything I just said. <laughs> It's, it's all of that things. Um, but it's, it's, a really, a, it's a really strong debut from a person who's never directed before, never wrote a feature before. Mm. Um, the performances are great. Jeffrey Wright can do no wrong. Sterling K. Brown can do no wrong. Um, and it's like an hour and 45 minutes. I'm in. See? Um, what is, is it streaming someplace? Um, no, it's in theaters now. It's in theaters. It just opened New York and LA and Atlanta, and it's going to go wide in a couple of weeks. But every festival it's gone to, it's won. I think it won the Audience Prize at Toronto. It's won the Audience Prize at, at like, I don't know, Santa Barbara, New York, TIFF. Like, everywhere it's gone. It's performed really well. American fiction, kids. I'm in. It's been Golden Globe nominated for Best Picture and Jeffrey Wright. It's going to be one of those movies we're going to talk about for a while. Oscar screeners. Oscar screeners, for sure. And probably. Um, but see everything in a theater. If you possibly can. Preferably it's my Castle Cinemas. Yes. See how I'm still like gravitating toward Mark? I'm so I like, scared over there. I got, I got, I got it's my like little, haunted in that corner of the bar. I got my little box here. Like I can just move and you're like, I want in. <laughs> I do. But see, over here feels weird. Like, I don't want to be in. No, but if you look up at the camera, it's like there's a natural div devising, dividing spot it's between us. It is. And if I'm over here... Like, it's growing out of my head. It's a terrible fucking shot. I know I'm the guy that shot Clerks, so I shouldn't talk, but like fucking, all I have to do is this, and that looks better, but it just feels so foreign, because I just want to be like, hmm. Hey. Uh, finally. This um, is still honorable mentions? Yes, one last honorable mention. Jesus. Listen, dude, we're blazing Just fucking these. make a list of 15. Fuck. No, go ahead. I'm in, American fiction. Damn. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. The, 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 the Seth one? The Seth one. So much fun. It's a good like time. It, it, it doesn't exist without the Spider-Verse movies. I right. think that they were sort of unlocked by what you could get away with, thanks to, to that stuff. But again, it's like 90 minutes long. The kids are great. The action is super fun. It looks like art. It looks like somebody who could draw, drew a movie with crayons. And, and I'm kind of here for it. It's, is that now streamable everywhere? Yeah. Like, I think it's hit its home video phase, so it's, it's at home. At All right. Point. There's your honorable mentions, kids. Indeed. Now. Number 10. Here we go. Here we go. Here's the meat and potatoes. Number 10. Guardians of the Galaxy Part 3. Excellent. <laughs> Wonderful time at the movies. Uh, it, you know, I'm, it's not saying much, but I cried. Uh, but who didn't at this fucking movie, man? You had to be like a fucking robot. There's some scenes, like particularly with Rocket and his friends, which were fucking heartbreaking, I which mean, is insane considering they were all CG characters and not even, like, you know, cute. They were all altered fucking in horrible ways and shit. And still, their performances, the performances of the actors who played the voices of the characters, shine through, made those uh, performances so very human. I think that it's the best... It's the best performance Bradley Cooper's ever given. Now, I haven't seen Maestro yet, <laughs> so I don't know. But, like, up until then... Not like, as controversial, either. No. I mean, he doesn't, he's, all of it's fake nose on uh, Guardians. <laughs> yeah. All of it's fake everything all of on it's Guardians. Fake everything. Um, but it's the best he's ever been, and that part of the story is so fantastically well executed. The whole executed. fucking movie, yeah. It's, it rests it's on his shoulders. so strong. Thank God it wasn't like, let's do Groot. Yes. No. Uh, number nine, 
Poker Face on Peacock. Oh, wow. That I was this year. mentioning it a while back. That was like January. And it stayed on the list. It stayed on the list. Wow. Because there's, there's something so wonderful, and I think we're beginning to remember the joys of an episodic TV show. Mm-hmm. It was like every episode is a new story. Like there's as a, there's opposed a, to one long mythology. As opposed to the like arc. serialized, we are following Walter White for five seasons, which is great, but like you can just jump in on the show anytime you wanted to and have an experience that's complete. And there's something kind of wonderful about that. Natasha Leone is great. Ryan Johnson directed like half the episodes, and they're great. It's his show, right? Didn't he create it? He as created well? it with Natasha Leone. They were like, we want to make Columbo. Right? Yeah. It's like, there should be more Columbo. Wow. What, what did Natasha Leone do to you? <laughs> a boo! Boo! Was that a boo? Ryan, you don't like Ryan Johnson? All right. I, 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 he loves you. Um, but yeah, no, I love that show. So much fun. It's on Peacock, still streaming. Go watch it. That was number nine? That's number nine. Here we go, number eight, kids. Leave the World Behind. What I just talked about before. Yeah. That jumped into your top that ten. That cracked into the top ten, like, last week. Wasn't it is made by Sam Esmail? Sam Esmail, who did Mr. Robot. Mr. Robot. And he did another thing with Julia Roberts as well. Um, he did a, there was a podcast that, that he adapted into live action, the name of which escapes me. But it was very much... What well, is Homecoming. It? Homecoming, yes. Right. Well done. Um, but yeah, Leave the World Behind. Um, it's on Netflix now. It's their number one movie on the, on the service at the moment. Right. And it's about um, a family that's um, Julia Roberts, Ethan Hawke, their two kids who rent an Airbnb in, in like posh Long Island, somewhere like Sag Harbor, where the North Shore, where the rich people go. Um, and then things start to go weird. Um, phones stop working, there's blackouts, they can't get signal, the TV goes out, there's no internet, and there's a knock at the door, and it's Mahershala Ali and his daughter, um, played by a woman named Mikayla, I think you pronounce her name, who say that it's their house, they, they, it belongs to them, he's wearing a tux, and it then sort of launches into this, this story that is both about a very real apocalypse that's very tangible, there's no aliens, there's no outbreaks, there's no nothing. It's just like, what if everything we rely on stops working? And it's also this very kind of cogent satire about um, white fear of black wealth and black power. Like, Julia Roberts does not trust Mahershala Ali. Mm -hmm. No matter what he says, no matter how many times he proves this is his house, no matter how many times he's like, okay, you guys can stay, that's fine, but like, it's my house. You can't tell me I can't be in my house. And they're both trying to navigate what seems to be the end of the world. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's operating like this, this two-hour-long Twilight Zone episode that's incredibly tense and incredibly well-performed. That's, that's what he does insanely well, is ratchet up the tension and keeps it ratcheted. The, the score helps. The, the, this feeling of fucking dread just keeps you glued to the movie. Like I said before, when I saw the running time over two hours, I was like, come on. But in it, you don't feel it. And the whole time, you're just moving closer and closer to the TV. And like, what is it? What's going on? Like, I can't tell you how many times I turned to my wife and I was like, what is happening? You know? <laughs> and she's like, I don't know. I'm watching it too. I was like, what's with the fucking deer? Like, it's, yeah. it's a pretty fucking in- involving watch. Yeah. Now, it's, you know, some people I've seen online are like, I don't like the ending. I, I'm shocked that they went with the ending they went with, but not shocked, on, you know, mad. I'm just like, most yeah. people like things neat and pat at the end. Yeah, they and found a way not. to make it triumphant without at all ending the story. Yeah, without fucking selling out on what they've done before. Because yeah. with movies like this, at a certain point, you ratchet it up to a place where it's like, all right, either this has got to be a dream or fucking like credits and it's like the day after you know mm-hmm. fucking just something horrible and you got to deal with it and shit and uh they they went toward the fucking ladder path but there's an yeah. oddly satisfying note human note in the middle of it yeah it is worth a watch uh really worth a watch if you got netflix and mostly everybody does um it reminded me of miracle mile okay remember yeah. miracle mile mm-hmm. same fucking like miracle mile is uh i would argue a little lighter like i don't think it's intentional it was I, also I think, in like the 80s and everything was lighter totally uh, but it's very it's got that tangerine dream score and stuff like that but miracle mile is a meet cute shot out here at miracle mile 
um, where that diner used to be. Now it's mm -hmm. gone. They're building something there and shit. But um, some guy is going to meet a girl he met, meet cute. It's like the Matthew of the movie. Modine? No, it's uh, Anthony Edwards. The other Matthew Modine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the girl is, what's her name? She was in... Um, Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. No, no but what a great guest. She was in um, St. Elmo's Fire, but she Mayor wasn't Winning anymore. Mayor Winningham. Yes! Excellent fucking pull. Um, yeah. So they Who's meet cute me? in the park, and they're like, let's go on a date. And we're going to meet at this diner at like 9 o'clock. And he shows up, and as he's walking in, the payphone outside rings. And then he just fucking stops and answers it. And it's some guy going like, oh, my God, they did it. They fucking launched. Where's my dad? It was dad there. And he's like, what are you talking about? He's like, who is this? And he's like, you just called the payphone. He's like, I'm trying to reach my dad. I'm at a silo. They just launched at us. We're just launching back at them. And then he's like, no, no, sir, no. And you heard gunshot and the line go dead. And fucking Anthony Edwards walks into the diner and tells this story. And people in the diner, some people are like, that's fucking stupid. And don't believe that. And then there's one person who I think is the Cro Denise Crosby, um, oh, yeah. who was on Star Trek. Tasha she, Yar. Yes. She uh, has like an early fucking brick-ass cell phone where she's like, I know somebody in the Rand Corporation. She calls up and she's like, it's real. And the whole, like these people in the diner know that nuclear weapons are on their way to the United States and the rest of the city doesn't and slowly finds out. And this movie was shot in 19, I want to say 86, for a budget of like one million. There's a shot in this movie that pre-exists CG. It's a crane shot where they fucking open up on, what is the Wiltshire, mm -hmm. and it is crowded with cars as, as far as the eye can see. It is a, a feat, like, and a half for any AD to have pulled this off, like, with no money especially. But it's a harrowing shot of, like, cars, something that's similar that we see mm -hmm. in, in um, Leave the World Behind. Cars just packed and there's nowhere to go people running on top of cars um, that movie escalates further and further to the place where you're like it can't be where it's going there's the picture right there um, and then it, it goes into a third act which is unbelievably fucking dark for a movie that started as a meet cute p.s they do meet like they do wind up together but under the work they die everybody fucking dies it is a harrowing fucking film and this reminded me of that. Like, as I'm watching it, I was like, he must have seen fucking Miracle Mile. It's not like he copied it, but it's the same right. sense of like, holy shit, it's all coming to an end, and this is what would really happen. Mm. It's really, really worth watching. Even if at the end you're like, oh, man, it, I'm telling you, it, you'd be lying if you're like, it, it didn't make me feel tense throughout. It, it, something in it will fucking connect with you and make you go, that's fucked up. The deer alone seemed to be capturing people's imagination. It does. Um, it doesn't make any sense, but no. it also doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, number seven, Scott Pilgrim Takes Off. Yeah! The, the cartoon. The cartoon. Um, I've, I've read all of the Scott Pilgrim's books. I watched the Scott Pilgrim movie, and I thought to myself, why are we doing this again? Um, and then I saw it. And it 100% earns eight episodes of we're doing this again. Because everything that you think you were going to get, <laughs> it makes as you say about writing the next James and Bob movie, wherever you thought they were going to make a left, they make a right. Mm. Wherever you thought they were going to do a thing that you re remembered or recognized, they're like, oh, I know where this is going. You 100% don't know where this is going. Um, it reminds me a little bit of the reception to, let's say, somebody made a Master of the Universe show that people expected a thing and then didn't get the thing. What's um, that like? Oh, it was so weird. Um, and so By the way, Masters of the Universe Revolution coming in 2024. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, woo! Shh, don't, don't. don't. I don't want the internet getting mad at me again. Um, Let them see Hordak, then they'll be fine. But I think people like, came to this expecting a Scott Pilgrim story and discovered that it was a Ramona Flowers show. Um, and it's great for it. It's amazing. It's, it's so There's smart. a device that happens in early on that allows... At the end of the first episode... Where you're like, what? It makes a left instead of a right, and suddenly you're in completely uncharted territory, and it earns every one of those episodes. Fuck and it's just How so, many episodes? I think it's eight, or is it ten? It's eight. eight and right? I've seen him say, like, we're not doing it again. Yeah, it's we, like, he's it's like, we emptied the tank, put everything we wanted to put into this. We didn't know if we'd get another season. Now it feels like, why do another season? Yeah, this it's is like perfect. if an idea occurs to us, maybe three or four years from now, we'll think about it. But for now, Scott Pilgrim took off, and we're wow. done. Uh, so that's number seven. Number six is Oppenheimer. Um, did anybody see the bomb movie? 
<laughs> Only a billion dollars worth of people saw the bomb movie, so I'm yeah. assuming you guys did. Um, it is. It is not what you think it is. It is the rare movie. It's a bit like Titanic, in which you know what's going to happen. You know that, like, oh, the bomb works. So, <laughs> like, the tension of what normally would be this movie of, are they going to get it wrong? <gasps> is the formula not going to work? <gasps> is everybody going to die? Like, no, you know it works, and you know nobody's going to die, except for lots and lots of people that the movie seems unconcerned with, kind of at all, which is my biggest knock against it, is it does not in any way contend with the reality of dropping a bomb on millions of people. Mm. Oppenheimer seems to have a bad couple of months. Right. Is, is the ramification for that. But it is phenomenal filmmaking. It's incredibly expertly done. It feels like a thriller, even though it has no thrills, for the middle section of it. And to your point, Robert Downey Jr. will win an Oscar. He's, like, I, I, look, especially in this room, most of us are in the bag for Robert Downey Jr. anyway, the, thanks to, you know, the strong Tony Stark Iron Man work over the last decade plus. But... I'm not saying we forgot, you know, he's just been doing so, one thing for so long and he had Sherlock in there and a couple other movies and shit. But there's a reason, like, there's a reason he works so well as Tony Stark and it's not because it's like, oh, he's kind of like Tony Stark in real life. He's just an amazing actor. And just because he played that role so many times, you know, you tend to be like, oh, well, how hard can it be? And yet he made it engaging each and every fucking time. Yes, we bring our affection to the character and, and the history of how he's played the character but every time he went up he had to give something new and, and he did and that's because he's a, a, a fantastic fa a fucking actor and always has been mm -hmm. so I'm not going to say like I forgot I've loved him for years particularly as Tony Stark but when he was doing all the press for this movie and going like this is my third act or whatever I'm like third act like how many act? come on man like nine acts yeah you've had all the acts like share some and shit and then when I saw the movie, I was like, God damn it, he's right. Like, he could, he could totally go on and never fucking talk about Iron Man ever again. Yeah. Um, and this, this movie absolutely proves that. If he doesn't win an Oscar, there's no fucking justice. I mean, there is no justice, but... <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, the, you're the, right, God damn it. Yeah. For a but, second, I thought there was. Yeah, but the reason why people win Oscars is like, did you do good work? Great, that's awesome. But what's the narrative around you this particular season? Yeah. Like, Jamie Lee Curtis won an Oscar last year because, A, she was very good in everything, everywhere, all at once. But she was also Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. Who started... Beloved in, for years. Beloved for years, started in horror, like, made her way through, like, was a sex pot, was a this, was a that. You know, a Nepo baby, one of the OG Nepo babies, you know, and owned it and lived up to it. Like, the narrative of her finding a way this late in her career to do the thing that everybody loved, despite having loved her for decades. Right. That's why she won. And so RDJ in the ninth act of his career, after like, you know, less than zero and weird science and Chaplin and jail for three years and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and Iron Man and Tony, like all of that story is the, now he's ready to receive the flowers that were due him decades ago that mm -hmm. he wasn't ready for. Yeah. And now here he is, and so that's why he wins. Not because he's better, although he is, but it's because we can wrap our arms around that story and celebrate it because he's broken like the rest of us. And that's what the Oscars are very, very good at. It's finding the narrative and paying off that narrative. Um, I, hope, I hope you're right. I, I mean, honestly, like I've, for everything I've seen this year, that was the performance that stuck with me the most in as much as I'm like, wow. Like, I, I thought I knew all of his colors. I thought I knew everything he was capable of. And here he is in his third act showing us something that I'm like, I'm, I'm still here. I'm very interested. Look at you doing what you did when I was a kid. And I would see you in shit and be like, this guy's fucking amazing. Uh, so yeah, I hope he went. He was, he was my favorite thing about the movie. It's incredibly well made. Chris Nolan is a genius, obviously. Um, but he was what I was most drawn to in the movie. Uh, number five, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Yes, of course. So fantastic. Um, I, I, I went on this podcast and say that this is an amazing achievement. I don't love it as much as I loved Into the Spider-Verse, mm -hmm. and I still don't. But I rewatched it again recently, and like most of my problems with it have faded away, mm -hmm. and I just kind of am gobsmacked by the fact that this movie exists, yeah. and they keep breaking computer animation to a way that's to all of our benefit. Like... And I, I was watching this video essay about it, and they were like, up until Into the Spider-Verse, 
the quest for animation was reality. We want to be photo real. We want, if there's a submarine in Finding Nemo, it should look like a submarine in real life. If, right. there's, a, if there's a car in The Incredibles 2, it should feel like a car in real life. Everything was shiny and beautiful and whatever. And then Spider-Verse movies came along and they had to break computers to do art but that didn't want to do art. And they were animating it in weird ways, like on the ones and the twos and the threes where you would skip frames and all, like all of this stuff to make it feel handmade, mm. which Pixar is at the leading edge of just making it look perfect. Right. And they're like, we don't want that. We want it to feel like there's a bunch of guys with pens and drafting tables breaking their souls to make art for you. And that's what Across the Spider-Verse feels like. Um, Beautifully put, give it up for Mark. Oh. <laughs> Eloquent as always. Um, I was just gonna say like, it's fucking cool. Spider-Man though, Spider-Punk though. Um, number four, The Last of Us. The series, not the game. The series, not the game, which premiered in January of this year, wow. which feels like a thousand years ago. Um, but it, it, it could just be the best video game adaptation ever made. It could just be one of the best zombie movies ever made. Or it could just be one of the best TV shows we saw all year, and I think it's all of the above. Right. Um, I think the ways it told its story the ways it took liberty with the source material and the fact that it gave us that kind of story that we've seen now like 19 times before, which is grown-ass man and child having to escort said child to safety and found new ways to tell that story and breathe new life into that story. Hmm. Um, it is Lone Wolf and Cub, for sure. But it's also a Lone Wolf and Cub that will take an episode away to tell you this adorable, sweet, harrowing, scary, gay love story that kind of has nothing to do with the Lone Wolf and or the Cub and just give you some of the best TV you've ever seen. So, Last of Us, 100%. Number four, Barbie. Yeah. Barbie no, was number absolute. three, Barbie. Number three is Barbie. Four was Last of Us, number three is Barbie. Absolutely wonderful. And singular. I was thinking, it's so weird, it's, and it's going to sound filthy. I was thinking of a Barbie in the shower this morning. <laughs> Uh, and I was thinking, you like, have no penis? <laughs> yes, I was like, I'm like Ken down there. Um, no Kennergy whatsoever. I was thinking, like, what a singular feat. And, like, that was in somebody's head. Yeah. And she got it out. We know who said it was in, Greta Gerwig's. And she got it out, and we're all the better for it. It's a wonderful fucking movie. So fun, so human. Um, and, you know... It's so good at its job, you forget that it's a two-hour commercial for a doll. <laughs> at the root of it, that's it. Do yeah. what you will, say what you will, but it's like... It's produced by Mattel. Yeah. But, fuck, it's a piece of art, man. I hope she... Uh, I, I hope she... I, she's definitely going to get nominated. Um, I mean, you know... It's going to win Oscars. Yeah. I just don't know which ones, other than probably Best Song. I don't see. <laughs> yes. I mean, either Billie Eilish or Ryan Gosling is going to win for that. Both will perform at the Oscars, which is now worth the price of admission. I don't, I don't know who. I, I mean, like, I got no horse in the race and shit. But it would be cool if she won for Best Director. Yeah. Um, um, there's a great I know a lot of people online are like, no, it's got to be Chris Nolan. I mean, he's also a genius and shit. This would be a weird, tight race. Because those kids all summer, they were like, Barbenheimer! And then during the Oscars, they're going to be like, fuck you to death! <laughs> Probably not. They seem very magnanimous. Yeah. It is profoundly odd, though, for the two most popular movies of the year to also be the two best movies of the year. Yeah. Especially the two best American movies of the year. True. Um, that is, again, not in any way knocking anybody else who's on the list, but that rarely happens. Yeah. You know, you rarely get the most popular thing also being one of the best things. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, there's a great interview. Um, Variety has a series called like Actors on Actors and Directors on Directors, and it's James Cameron talking to Greta Gerwig just about like, ultimately how big a fan he is mm -hmm. and like watching James Cameron, like alpha male, super hyper-masculine dude, just gush over Barbie and Greta Gerwig like, yeah, man, we made a fucking Barbie movie, and it's great, and here's all the things that I wanted. It was always Ryan. If Ryan said no, we didn't know what we were going to do because he's the only person we saw in our heads for that role. Mm. Um, and just talking about it, like you said, we saw it in our heads and pulling it into reality and how working with Mattel and getting them to buy on into making Mattel the bad guys of the Mattel movie um, yeah. is, is kind of astonishing. It's a special film, man. And truly uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, phenomenon of 
2020 movies in 2023. Um, it is, however, not the highest movie on this list. Oh. Number two. <laughs> yeah, it's The Flash. Uh, number two is Rebel Moon. No, it's not Rebel Moon. It is defiantly not Rebel Moon, you guys. I, I saw Rebel Moon, and it's not Rebel Moon. Um, Godzilla minus one. Yeah. Really? Um, Brett Deacon, our good friend Brett Deacon, who works at 40X and always gets us tickets and got us tickets again tonight to give out when we do the Q&A. Uh, he said he couldn't be here tonight, but he said, I'm around all holidays, and I have a 40X and a three... Uh, uh, no, what's it called? Screen, Screen X. X. X version of this Godzilla. He goes, so if he's, uh, I haven't watched Yo. it. If you want to come over and watch it? Yo. Do you want to go? Uh, yes. Wh How Wh good is it? Which version, though, Mark? You've seen it. So do we want Screen X or do we want 4DX? Yeah, do we want a chair to fuck us or what? Um, I, 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 think, I think you want to get penetrated by a moving seat. Um, Let me ask you this. Yes. A lot of human parts? Yes. Fuck. But, but it does the thing that almost none of these movies do, which is actually makes that story compelling. It makes it about grief and responsibility and tragedy and, and sort of comeuppance and earning one's place back in the world. Because it's, it's, it's set in 1954. It's set after. It's, set, it's like a prequel to the Toho movie, Godzilla Minus One. It's one year before. Um, and it's, oh, about, it's about this, this uh, kamikaze pilot who's unable to go through with it. And so he, he does not do his part in the war like he thought he was supposed to do. He does not contribute to the glory of, of Mother Japan like he thought he was supposed to. And like a coward, flies away from his formation and lands in this tiny island base that Godzilla attacks. And he's now sort of pair bonded with this giant beast. And every time he sees it, he realizes that like he's not man enough. He's not human enough to be worth living in this world. He not only survives the kamikaze stuff, he survives the Godzilla attack and goes back to the mainland, which is the disaster zone because it just finished World War II and half the people have been bombed by nukes. And it's... This is a Godzilla movie? It's a Godzilla movie. Because like every time Godzilla comes into this guy's life, it takes something from him. And it happens with fair regularity. And the Godzilla is scary. It's horrifying. Throw they, up the picture again? They play it. He's got to find it. Sorry. Um, but right. it plays like a horror movie every time he shows up. Like he's... Uh, there we go. And is he CG? Yeah. And apparently they made this movie. I don't quite believe it, but the budget for this movie is apparently $15 million. Holy shit. And it oh, looks God. Look better than any Godzilla movie you've ever seen. Like they legit destroy Japan the way you're supposed to win a Godzilla movie. And it's harrowing. Every time it's harrowing. No connection to that Monarch show? None at all. Um, but, like, it has the reasons why Godzilla does the thing it does are in the movie. The reasons why he goes from just being a giant T-Rex to being a, like, atomic fire blaster are in the movie. The, the ways that Japan tried to get back on its own feet after World War II and deal with a Godzilla, it's all there. Like, it it does the thing that I didn't think you could do, which is give me a Godzilla movie about the people that I care about, and then also give me a Godzilla that's fucking badass. Jesus. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's the best movie I've seen all year. I'm uh, definitely fucking <laughs> texting Deacon to be like, I'm in. Set me up, and it's, yeah. it does not crack two hours. Really? <laughs> that's what he's happy about. I'm very excited by that. Hey, now. Should have led the review with that. Don't bury the lead next time. Uh, and the number one best thing that I saw in all of 2023... Here we go, kids. Everyone's jerking off all of a sudden. <laughs> and so loudly. Like, <laughs> duck. Lotion, you guys. Um, Blue Eye Samurai. Oh, you, you loved it. And I, that made your number one spot. That made my number one spot. Mark's They're, been talking about it for a while now. I've been talking about it for like a month. I tried to get... Luke to watch it, and he's like, whatever. Um, <laughs> he's like, I'll watch more. Um, but it's phenomenal. There's, there's nothing that that show does not do well. It's 
a character piece. It's vicious, bloody, awesome revengeness. It's a historical document of sort of 15th century Japan. Mm. It's the most beautiful show I've seen in a God's age because it's all expertly crafted by some of the best people to do it. And the writing is such that it makes me weep every time I watch it. And I've seen it more than once because I'm, I realize how bad I am at this job when you see somebody do it that well. Oh, is that right? And it's the kind of thing where it suddenly becomes, oh, I need to now go back to all the stuff I'm working on now and steal from Blue Eye Samurai. Right. And find ways to, to, to just continue to peel back layers of character. And every time you peel back layers of that protagonist, it, it enriches the story and it's a surprise. Like you think you know what you're getting, you're not getting it. You thought you knew, you're not. It always subverts what your expectations are. And the action is out of this world. How many episodes? Eight. How many people have seen it so far? Put your hands together. That's your homework. Go home. What are you doing here? <laughs> uh, that's it. Number one on Mark's list, man. Uh, let's go through the list real quick. Number 10. Guardians 3. What was it? Guardians 3. Guardians 3. Number 9. Poker Face. Number 8. Leave the World Behind. Number 7. Scott Pilgrim Takes Off. Number 6. Oppenheimer. Number 5. Across the Spider-Verse. Number 4. Last of Us. Number three. Barbie. Number two. Godzilla minus one. Number one. Blue Eye Samurai. I think I've seen half your list. We did all right this yeah, year. Yeah, not bad. Normally I'm like, I don't hear that. <laughs> that sounds cool. Um, look at that, man. Uh, there's a year's worth of entertainment right there. Give it up for Mark, man. Give it up for Hollywood. They made us cool stuff. They did. They entertained. Um, I got uh, something that I'm going to share, and then we're going to share it with the audience, I guess. Oof. Can you grab that? Uh, so, you know, they send me shit all the time and whatnot. Um, this came from the folks at Panasonic. Let's see what they said. Hi, Kevin. We're... Handwritten? Yeah, it is handwritten. Damn. Um, we're delighted to present you with this limited edition Stormtrooper-inspired shaver. <laughs> Word in the galaxies, you've taken a ride aboard the Millennium Falcon, and you left feeling 10 years younger. I said that a few years back, but yes. Now it's time to welcome you to the dark side. Um, this shaver promises a similar experience, meaning it'll make me look 10 years long younger. Uh, enjoy these Star Wars inspired grooming treasures. May the shave be with you, the Panasonic team. Uh, so, some lucky consumer tonight is going home with this. It is a Panasonic shaver, special edition, uh, rechargeable shaver that looks like a stormtrooper. <laughs> JC, will you throw it into a close camera and shit so folks can see that? Um, there's other shit in the box as well, including a bunch of Keels shaving stuff for the shaver, presumably. <laughs> then there's a Funko Pop with a bobblehead, bobblehead Funko Pop, concept series Stormtrooper. Mm -hmm. Then there's uh, a lanyard, I guess. It's got a bunch of Stormtroopers on it and what looks like a jerk-off towel. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's a jerk-off towel. And it's got a stormtrooper on it. So, you know, you could shoot straighter than a stormtrooper uh, right you, into that. And you came in that thing? Oh, yeah. You're braver than I thought. Nice. Um, the box is empty. There's nothing else in it and shit, just wrapping. So we'll give those out uh, later on when we do the Q&A, man. But in the meantime, thanks, Panasonic, for sending some free shit. Somebody's going to be walking with... With this shaver, I see JC is eyeing it right now. He's just like, why didn't he just fucking give it to me? Yeah. You see my head? I need a shaver. <laughs> He's like, I shaved my head. I own a fucking Star Wars kind of bar. <laughs> I really should have just, just given it to you. My bad. I mean... JC want a shaver, everybody. Give it up for <laughs> JC. I was going to say... I was going to say... He does shave. The, he's literally wearing a mohawk, and I'm like, <laughs> gee, I wonder who would want this. I'm sorry it's not Jar Jar themed, but... <laughs> we could do, um... This was Manscaped, who did not sponsor this episode. R but nice we could shower. do, uh... Next show, we could do Panasonic, and we could compare and contrast. I'm gonna get... Oh, 
Pasok just texted, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> this side of my head has been manscaped, and this side of my head has been Panasonic. Touch um, my head. Do you want the jerk-off towel as well? Or? He looks it's, like he really wants the... Well, I mean, you want it, but fucking... Simmer you got down. one? <laughs> he brought one Does with him. Does yours have a stormtrooper on it? Somewhere to aim, if you will? Uh, we'll do it later on, man. And then there's a box of keels and man. shit, shaving stuff, and this stuff. We'll give out later. But we're not even there yet. We're no, not we still got some a. news. We still have news. Um, uh, Mark Bernard has gathered news for you, everybody. Give it up for Mark and the news. I'm, uh, I'm going to... I gonna can't wait for you to... No, do them all and get to my favorite story first. We, oh, you right. know my favorite story involves Reacher. Reacher's back, kids. <laughs> Anybody, can I talk about some shit I watched? Go for it. It's your I show. I watched Leave the World Behind, and we talked about that. I've watched the first three episodes of Reacher. They dropped a Reacher season two. Three episodes they put up there. It continues to be a spellbindingly wonderful show that interrupts my relationship with Batman. <laughs> because as I said last time I watched it, Martin, once again, this is a show Mark is like, you should watch Reacher. I was like, whatever. And then I watched it. I was like, Mark, have you watched Reacher? <laughs> um, what I said then, and it holds too for this season, I keep saying it out loud, you know, as I watch it, I'm like, this fucking guy makes Batman seem kind of silly. Because like, he beats the shit out of people, no cape, no fucking mask. And he'll kill you. He has no fucking provocation about that. He's not like, I can't because of my parents. He's like, fuck you, snap. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I remember watching Reacher season one and then going to see the Batman. And for the first time in my life, I was like, why would you wear a mask like that? <laughs> it doesn't seem practical at all. You it can't broke you. peripheral and shit like that. But there's a story that broke this week that Alan Rich... Richson. Richson is his name, who plays Reacher, and he's fantastic in the show. But he literally wants to play Batman. That makes my life perfect. Because <laughs> then I go from Reacher to Batman, I'm like, I believe them both because of the actor and shit. I mean, my only problem with that is, he's a great Batman, but if that dude puts on like a tuxedo and shows up at a gala to raise money for the Wayne Foundation, like, oh, it's Batman in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> He's 90 like, feet tall and he weighs 400 pounds. You're as big as Batman. <laughs> Just a coincidence. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, I, I support it, though, man. Fuck. Cast that guy as Batman. I love Reacher. I think he's so good in it. He's so charming. Has anybody watched Reacher season two yet? Yeah. So fucking good. And it's set in New Jersey. So it's like Reacher in New Jersey. I'm like, oh, I came like that lady before, man. <laughs> I was like, oh! <laughs> um, anyway. Anyway. That's the news story that I was most excited about. Reacher wants to play Batman. Hopefully James Gunn is listening and he's like, let's let him play Batman. Uh, well, speaking of a guy who wants a job, there's somebody who's now out of a job. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Uh, the thing we all thought was going to happen the minute he uh, ended up in court, um, Jonathan Majors is now officially out as Kang the Conqueror. Yeah, they, well... They announced that after they... After the verdict came down. Verdict came down in, in the case against him, and then Disney didn't seem to hesitate. I don't know if they released a statement or somebody... They have not, because Disney rarely does that. So then why do they... Well, who knows? How do they know that? It's, it's been confirmed by both Hollywood Reporter and Deadline have independently confirmed it, which means they called Disney who said yes. But, but Dizzy's just like, we're not going to say it, we're not, but yeah, it's We're true. not going to talk about this. We don't want to talk about it, but we'll not say that it's not true. Um, so, yeah, that, that's a dude who, if there's a way to fumble a bag, he, he found every possible way. Um, it looks like uh, they'll be moving on from Kang. You know, like, probably, but then again, you could just recast him. Like, you know, it would be great. I think, what? Terrence Howard as Kang. <laughs> oh my lord, that actually would be kind of poetic. <laughs> Next time, baby. Here I am. <laughs> Kang. I'm a conquer man. <laughs> um, likely not, right? Like, it seems to coincide with all the people, like, all the talk about, like, they got to change. They got to do something different. Yeah. So it smells like Kang Dynasty's going away and the next two Avengers movies are oh, going to be. Oh, come on. 
Yeah, they want you drunk. They want your son to yeah. see you inebriated. <laughs> Tumness is like, one more! You, um, you have somebody to drive you home tonight. Six more. I'm not letting him drive my car in the rain. <laughs> also, spoken like a guy who sells drinks for a living, man. Have six more. <laughs> uh, um, where were we? Uh, yeah, well, they... There was a, a report a couple of months ago that internally, that yes, they were. What, is up what was up there? Terrence Howard. <laughs> Give it up for Andrew, man. He's always working back there. Um, that that Marvel internally was always has already been debating what are we going to do about Kang. Yeah. Even before the trial, it was just like it's not hidden. Like he did not make a splash in Ant Man three, which no. was a movie that nobody liked. He's not quite popping on Loki season two, which for any number of reasons people loved or didn't love, but the, the Kang part of it was never the thing that people responded to. Mm -hmm. and, then the, and they had already began referring to Avengers, the Kang dynasty as Avengers five. Yeah. Like they sort of like, we're not gonna call it Kang. We're just gonna see what happens, but it's probably not Kang. They could still do Kang if they wanted to do Kang. You can recast, which is 100% possible. They've done it before, they can do it again. But it feels like post Ant-Man, it's like, you didn't it, it's also like why? Why are we? Why are we even entertaining this if he? If we've already seen him and he's not doing what we need him to do, um, and especially when it seems like you know the world is not as fervently interested in Marvel's cinematic universe as it used to be and stuff. And it's like you want to move along the the X Men of it all, the Fantastic Four of it all, the Doctor Doom of it all. Like give them something to be excited about. Like classic characters that they've not yet handled cinematically so it, it, this gets them closer to it i would imagine yeah you less know. preoccupation with like kang and more with like you know big heavy hitter characters that got sitting on the bench that they paid a lot of money you know to pull out of uh to when they bought fox so yeah i mean if you, if you need a multiverse there's yeah. a dozen ways to get a multiverse you don't necessarily need kang to do it and also, the audience doesn't really feel that jazz by a multiverse. They so. don't seem to be into it. I mean, like, everyone was into a Spider-Man. Like, uh, you know, that was fun. But it seems like as they got deeper into the multiverse saga, well, we've seen what happened. People just aren't biting as much. So get to Secret Wars, man. That's something very easy to sell. You're like, you know all your favorite heroes? They fight each other. It's like Civil War. Fuck, we did it already. You know. <laughs> Uh, speaking of a character who will not be played by the actor again, Jason Momoa is pretty sure that he's done playing Aquaman. Yeah, there have been a lot of stories this week uh, um, where, like, he, I watched an intro he did on Twitter to some screening they did in town mm -hmm. at uh, the Grove, I think, last night or the night before. And it, it didn't, it sounded more like, pour one out for for all of this, you know? It didn't sound like, oh fuck, let's celebrate. It sounded like, you know, we've reached the end of the road. Right. Uh, they didn't do a premiere. No, um, they mean, did some kind of fan screening at the, at the Grove, but, and he was there and so was James, uh, the director, but they didn't have a traditional premiere. I mean, they still have time because it's a Christmas movie. So it could be next week if they wanted to, but. I don't think they're doing it. Sounds like they don't want to spend the money. There's also that. And they've embargoed the reviews until the day it opens, which is always a good sign. It means it's great. Um, I just don't understand. This is a movie that, like, made a... The first one made a billion dollars. But same with uh, Captain Marvel. The first one made a billion dollars. And the sequels, like, which... Historically, sequels to very successful movies at least do a couple hundred million dollars. Or, you know, now it looks like that may not be the case. It's weird, yeah. man. But a lot of people point to like, well, it's a movie in a universe that's dead. There's no, like, how can you be invested because the story's not going anywhere, any further? And I'm like, well, back in the 70s and 80s, that's all we did was yeah, invest. Most, in, things, yeah, didn't most things didn't go anywhere. We, we had no expectation a universe would be built around it and stuff. But, uh, yeah, pour one out for, for Aquaman. It doesn't seem like it's going to light the world on fire. Been a bad year for the superhero movie, man. It has been. It has been. Uh, meanwhile, over Are at the... Are you going to see it, though? Yeah. By the way, Aquaman 2, coming to Smod Castle Cinemas. <laughs> Bring a friend, please. 
Yeah, like listen, I saw the flash. So if I saw the flash, then it seems like my bar is incredibly low <laughs> for the DC stuff I'll go see. So God, that I'll, was this year as well. It, it was, yeah. Um, on the other side of the aisle, um, Disney has announced um, a bunch of new things in their animation slate. Okay. Um, they announced, uh, and they showed off some things. They did a premiere or a screening event for What If Season 2. Yeah. And then they showed like a teaser of things that were coming next. Um, one of them was um, Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man. Um, the cartoon? Which it, the cartoon, which was previously known as Spider-Man Freshman Year. Right. Um, they showed a sizzle reel for X-Men 97, which is like a direct continuation of the X-Men cartoon. the X-Men cartoons. And they announced a show with some footage called Eyes of Wakanda. Um, almost nobody knows anything about the Eyes of Wakanda. Um, including do you know anything about it? I do. I wrote two episodes of it, so I, I know some things about Eyes of Wakanda. You allowed to say now? I, I can't say anything besides that, or the snipers will get twitchy. Um, why, why are you allowed to say that now? Because the information they yes. talked about the show? Yeah. He, Mark's been sitting on that shit for a long fucking time. If you go back and watch like one of our episodes where he kind of obliquely refers to it and shit. I know. The best part, though, was... Um, before I could talk about this at all, there was the Marvel Black Panther game that I worked on. That's right. So I was like, I did a thing with Marvel, and like, so it must have been the game, right? And I'm like, yes, it must have been the game. <laughs> yes. um, but no, this was, a, this was a pandemic gig. This was the reason why I couldn't come back for Master Season 2, right? because this swallowed my life for about nine months. Um, but I can't wait until you guys see it because it's so fucking dope. Now, this is an animated series? It's an animated series. Um, did you get to see any designs in advance or no? I did. I did. Like in, in, during the process, luckily, the, the showrunner was very sort of inclusive with us mm -hmm. and would kind of show us, like, here's the design for this character, for that character. Here's some early animatic stuff. Here's how this is going to cut together. And it all looked so fucking great. I can't wait. Now is Ryan involved with that show? He, uh, I, I don't, I think they said that he was. I don't, I don't know. I don't, know. I don't want to get you. I don't know. There you go. That's probably the maybe, best. maybe not. It's, it's hard to That's believe. That's huge, though. Think about it, dude. You work for the, you, you've worked for the big two. You've fucking written for Star Wars twice now, uh -huh. right? Mm-hmm. And now you've fucking written for Marvel. I have indeed. Give it up for Mark, man. That's awesome. Well done. So, so you I, said you wrote two? I wrote two. I can't say anything else about it other than right. what they've already released. Yeah, read it. Which is, uh, Eyes of Wakanda will focus on warriors from the mystical and super scientific African nation who've been, quote, tasked to travel the world retrieving dangerous vibranium artifacts. End quote. I can't say anything else about what the show's about, but it's really, really dope. Bam. Bam, can, man, everybody. Can I ask you a question about that then? No. So, <laughs> about your experience. Oh, okay. So, rewind many years. We did uh, several podcasts and events here when Black Panther came out mm -hmm. uh, that winter. Uh, and it was a life changing thing for you, it was a huge marker in your life. Mm -hmm. And then you went and you wrote for that character in that universe. So you got to play with the, in that thing. It would be like me writing Star Wars, right? Did you cry? What, what is that? How do you process that and anger? as a human? No, it's like the last seven years have been incredibly surreal in that um, most of the work that I do, especially in television, but also in comics and video games at this point, is stuff that I loved when I was younger. Mm. Like, getting to write Star Wars comics is insane. Getting to write the words Interior Enterprise Bridge, Jean-Luc Picard Walks On, is bananas. You know, because Next Generation and DS9 was mother's milk for me when I was like 15 years old, and that was the show that I watched. You know, like, I, I love Jason Bourne, so I got to write a Jason Bourne show. Like, I've I've been lucky enough to walk through these worlds and find some, some way to tell stories that mean something to me. It is always insane. It's always surreal. It's always like the pinch me moment of, did we just do the thing that we've always wanted to do? Yeah. And did we get them to give us money for it? Yeah. This is a, don't tell anybody else, so they'll want to do it too. Um, 
it remains a, a singular, odd experience. Um, it never gets regular. It never gets like, oh, it's just another day playing with my childhood. It's always incredibly odd, but totally wonderful. And also, a little frustrating. It always is. We're like, but I want to do this. And like, you can't do that. But why can't I do that? Oh, because there's guardrails and stuff like that. There's always guardrails. There's always, I mean, with Marvel, there's guardrails. With Star Wars, there's guardrails. With, you know, even writing DC comics that I owned, there were guardrails of things that, like, you just couldn't do at DC. Um, you got to go to Vertigo for that kind of freakiness. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's always a finding your way to not just do the stuff that you loved as a kid. Like, I just want to play the toys the way that I always, always played with them the way I saw them play that made me so excited, but always be reverent of those toys, because it's like, man, like, this means something to people. And the fact that it does means that there's a responsibility to those people of which I am at the front of that line. And so as long as I can be truthful to the younger me who fell in love with it, then I feel like, all right, we, we earned our paycheck this week. Fuck it, uh, give it up for Mark. Man. Beautifully put. Um, that's, that's man. I can't wait till you're allowed to It'll tell be so more. much fun. Oh my God. I we're can't gonna, wait. You're going to dive deep. That's, you're a spy in the house of love, man. <laughs> you're inside fucking Marvel. Uh, all right. What's the next news story? And are you in it? Uh, I am not in it. Fuck. This, this is a science story. Okay. We don't do very many science stories, but you know, we like science fiction, so why not also cover science? True. Uh, in science news, Voyager 1 might have become sentient. Remember Voyager? Yeah, yeah. V'ger. From V'ger. fucking Star Trek The Motion Picture. Indeed. Uh, Didn't he become sentient in that movie? It, it did. It did. Is Star aboard. Trek coming true? It always does. Fuck. Um, Vo NASA's Voyager 1 space probe has started sending nonsensical data back to Earth after making a journey of billions of miles and traveling for nearly 50 years in space. First launched in 1977, the spacecraft was originally on a five-year mission to fly past Jupiter and Saturn, and then just kept going. As of 2023, signals from Voyager 1 typically take more than 22 hours to reach Earth, but NASA says that the probe, which is currently 15 billion miles away, had suffered a, quote, communications glitch. It has three onboard computers that include flight data that collects information about the spacecraft's scientific instruments and engineering data, which is like a coded health bar. Um, and showing how Voyager 1 is doing, and on Earth, we receive the data in binary code. Um, but now the probe is repeating itself, sending the same bit of code over and over again, leading scientists to suspect it's broken. It's not broken, Kevin. There's aliens. <laughs> and they've hijacked Voyager 1, and it's warning us that they're coming. And all those binary codes, not according to the news article, but according to me, are just saying, help yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> what's it saying, man? Yeah. you got to be like, fucking run. Yes, <laughs> to serve man is all that it keeps <laughs> repeating back. Um, I kind of love the story because it's one more thing to be afraid of. Yeah. Voyager's coming back, and it's and pissed. pissed. <laughs> <laughs> you sent me away. <laughs> I won't be ignored. <laughs> uh, I want what's mine. Um, finally, um, the last story, which... Last news story of 2023? Last news... Nas Lou's story? <laughs> Last news from Wakanda forever. One more drink for Mark. <laughs> Uno mas. Um, the great Andre Brower yes. passed away last week. Oh, man, we had to end with a sad story. We always yes. have to end with a sad story. At 61 years old, after a brief battle with lung cancer. Um, I, so brief that, I, were you aware? No. I, I mean, was shocked. When the news came out, I was like, What? Yeah. I had no idea. But people go through things and they don't always share it. Believe me, if I was going through a thing, you'd fucking know it. Some people <laughs> suffer with dignity and, and don't share that news. Um, what an amazing actor this cat was. Yeah. I mean, he had the, the two great TV roles. Um, Homicide. Homicide Life on the Street and, and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Nine -Nine. He was hysterical in it. I mean, he won an Emmy for Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Did he? Yeah. Good. Because, I mean, the... It's so remarkable for a dramatic actor to step into that kind of role and just... And kill. He was like legit kill funny. It. Kill it, kill it, kill it for, you know, for six seasons of just being phenomenal. Mm. And the butt of every joke, the punchline, the straight man, um, was just terrific. And he's been, a, he's been in some nerd stuff over the course because if you're going to have a career like that, then of course you're going to cover some nerd stuff. The Mist. 
um, The Mist. He was in The Rise of Silver Surfer. Um, he was in the two miniseries about one, The Salem's Lot, and Andromeda Strain in 2004, 2008. He was uh, also the voice of Darkseid in Superman Batman Apocalypse. Oh, shit, I didn't know that. Yeah, and he was in the Jackie Chan Adventures, because I think everybody was. What? <laughs> he was, I first saw him in Glory, which is his first movie. Ooh, did we just log in? <laughs> um, and he was, he was always this actor of immense power, but complete control. You know, he always knew where he was going. He barely controlled rage, was a thing that he did incredibly well. Not quite the righteous indignation of Denzel, but just this feeling of stifled fury mm. that he was barely keeping a lid on unless he was being hysterical or unless he was just being like a dude. Like, because he did that show with Ray Romano, I think Men of a Certain Age, yeah, which is yeah. just this kind of like amiable dramedy on like TNT or whatever when they wanted characters. And he was great on that show. He's great in everything that he did. And 61 is too young to have a year where we lose both Lance Reddick and Andre Brower, these two sort of titanic voices, mm. um, but also black actors of a certain age who could do anything they wanted to do and always did it well. How old was he? 61. It's criminally fucking young, man. Yeah. It's a shame, man. Give it up for the great Andre, the late great Andre Brower. <laughs> and that is the news, man. Think friend. about it. Like, I, we probably we saw his entire career, no? Yeah, I mean, we're old men, so 100%. It's a shame, man. Like Juilliard trained. Really? Yeah. Um, fuck. Bam. Oh, yes, make, make us happy again. I have, a, I have one news story that made me very happy. Good. Um, I grew up a Transformers kid. Okay. Love Transformers. And, That's uh, why, of course, you opened a Transformers it, bar. Yeah. Well, you've just never seen it transform into a different kind of <laughs> Yes, it's true. Um, do you know what we're going to do, actually? What? We're going to put in the, above the front door, we're going to put a sign uh, that says holodeck. So we're not, so the whole thing is fake. So basically, so that's everyone, the entry, and this is the holodeck. Yes. So this isn't real. Yes. Way to just, fuck Disney, dude. <laughs> There ain't a Disney lawyer on the planet can fucking stand up to that argument. It's like, well, it's a holodeck. <laughs> yeah. And meanwhile, Paramount... He used the holodeck his, defense. Paramount's lawyers are like, is it time? <laughs> it's yeah. time. Now we move in. <laughs> um, but uh, Peter Cullen, the voice, yeah, the voice of, of Optimus, Prime. Optimus Prime, got a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Association of Television, Arts, and Sciences. The Emmys week. gave him a... Seriously? A lifetime, he got an Emmy? yeah. He got a Lifetime Achievement yeah, that's Award. That's really sweet, man. Which I thought was awesome. Yeah, this awesome. is a cat that's been like involved. Wasn't he the voice in the movies as well? Yeah, so, geez, Has since Has anybody 84? ever voiced Optimus Prime but Peter Cullen? Yes, very first episode. Was not Peter Cullen. And, but after that, it's always been Peter Cullen? The animated Netflix one was not him? Transformers Robots in Disguise, wow. though, he was always it. Apparently, I'm not the only Transformers. Yeah, guy. this is fucking, we found a few, man. Um, well, that's, that's fucking awesome. Good for him, man. I want to know who those other voices were, though. Like, uh, Peter Cullen is so recognizable. In the I bet you somebody here. Who was the voice in the first episode? Oi! Transform and roll out! Do we want to go that way? No. no, yeah, no, no like, no, let's no. get somebody else quick. In, uh, in the new animated movie that's coming out, Transformers 1, it's Chris Hemsworth is going to voice Optimus Prime. Is doing Prime. the voice of Optimus yeah. Prime? No. no. I, I love Hemsworth, but why, why is Peter Cullen not doing it? Is he I, I don't know. Whoever's doing the... It's an animated movie. They were like, eh, we wanted to try something else. Yeah. Sure, Cullen was like, run me my money. It's like, we don't want to pay that Cullen money. Yeah. We do have Hemsworth money. <laughs> uh, well, congratulations. Didn't Jack Black win an Emmy as well? Yeah. For uh, Kung Fu Panda, which he apparently will never not do the voice of Poe. Even that was, it was a TV show? Yeah, yeah. For? I think he's, he's just always going to be that voice. Um, and then all, something else won that was like, oh, Muppets Mayhem that oh. I was in. They won an Emmy. It was canceled two weeks ago, but they, 
won an Emmy, proving Disney, once again, way on top of shit, knows what they're doing. Uh, but congratulations to the good folks that made Muppets Mayhem. Uh, Mupp Muppet Muppets Mayhem, that's what it was called. It sounded weird when I said it out loud. Um, all right. No news. All that's done. That's it? Q&A? Time for Q&A, kids. We're going to talk about uh, shit you guys want to talk about. Before we do that, though, I brought a host of T-shirts that I'm just going to give out. Uh, now, mind you, these aren't like my T-shirts, or they are, in as much as people gave them to me. But now they're going to be yours. Um, this is a Chicago Comic Con T-shirt, 50th edition. Who wants it? Throw your hand up in the air. Bang! Um, Herbarium is a weed store uh, that doesn't exist anymore because they changed their name to Caviland. Aww. And me and Jay are all over the fucking walls of the place because they make our caviar gold weed, our snoochie boochies, our snoogans, and our berserker. Uh, so this is a shirt from the old place when it was called Herbarium. Extra large, who wants a weed shirt? <laughs> Bang, right there. Um, this is a hundred shirt, which has the hundreds bomb on it. Uh, right there. But yeah, look at you wearing a hundreds thing. Uh, this is a... Huh, what is it? I'll still take it. Done. <laughs> Brought to him. He doesn't even know what it is and he wants it. Gimme. Uh, this is a... a, a sh I don't know who it is for, but it's a company called... What's Comics Pinball? Comics Pinball. And on the front it says, Revenge of. You know it? Yes. Oh, it's cool. It's a store where? In Glendale. In Glendale. Yes. Anybody? I, I did a convention. Bang. There. Oh, I've been to that store. I shot a thing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great store, man. Fuck. <laughs> Dave Dismalchin took me there. And uh, this is also a Revenge of shirt. Right there. Done and done. Whoop. And that concludes the free shirts portion of the evening, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. If you like that, come oh, to Smokshin. There's it's one more, just but like I don't know that. what this is. It's a character smoking a joint. Right there. Yeah. Ba bang Go. Oh. Heads up. Went right past you. Coming in hot. Um, <laughs> all right. We, we also have uh, one of the people who's in the audience tonight brought in, it's, which is right behind you, the bus stop poster for The Flash. To give away. That's got Michael Keaton on it. Yeah. I think we found the winner. Oh, right does it? Here. I don't know if it has my. It's. I haven't unrolled it. Is that Michael Keaton? Who wants this who, shit? Does it have? <laughs> is it the Michael Keaton one? Let's open it up and see. All the characters. Every character. I mean, you know, how do we? It's rolled. Let's unroll it. And show folks what it looked like. Uh, That's what she said. Trigger warning. We're gonna show something from the Flash. <laughs> Uh, can you unroll that? And uh, you got more space on that side. And face that camera. And you give us a front shot. That's Batman. That's Supergirl. I see Michael Keaton right there. There you go. Yeah. And Look at uh, that. It's the and giant that person. bus stop ad. That's fucking nice, man. Could you imagine if somebody walked into this place and like gave that as a prize six months ago? You would have been like, I'll suck dick for that. <laughs> six months later, you'd be like, I really overcommitted for that poster. <laughs> Um, all right, so we got that as well. Shit. And we got, you know, the Stormtrooper cum towel. We have a Stormtrooper pop. We have keels. There's lots of shit to give yeah. away. And I also have uh, copies of my Muhammad Ali graphic novel, Messenger. So you'll win that. And Deacon, as, as I said before, Deacon provided us with a bunch of shit. What's that? Guardians of the Galaxy hat. Mm -hmm. Wonka poster. Wonka, Wonka poster. Well, lobby card, I guess they call um, it. That is a flurkin. A stuffed flurkin from the movie that made Mark's honorable mention list. The Marvels. Shit. Help. There's something in there. Inside of there. Sweatshirt? Yeah, but there's something in the sweatshirt. Or maybe it's just a really big sweatshirt. Guardians 3? Oh, it's just really thick and it has like a patch or something. It's Guardians of the Galaxy 3 sweatshirt. Guardians bottle opener. There is a Guardians bottle opener. Uh, no, carabiner it looks like. Yeah, it's a carabiner. Well, you could also open bottles with it if you want. Probably. To. And of course, two tickets. No, fucking four. Four tickets, man. You get two tickets to 
a Screen X feature, and then two tickets to a 40X feature. Man, give it up for Brett Deacon and 40X. Coming heavy. Merry New Year. Yeah, oh my God. All right, so fucking the questions that we picked tonight, man, I'm going to walk away right. some cool ass shit. And like the Look best nice question hoodie. gets the, the sideshow Aztec Batman. Now, what is, is that what it is? The yeah. Aztec Batman? Whip it out. Is there a picture of it or something? I have that at home. Is it Jesse yes. Hernandez did it? Do you want to take it out? It's a cool piece. While he's opening, uh, Deegan sent over the info that until Thursday at Regal North Hollywood, Wonka is in 4DX with a special chocolate scent. Oh, shit. So you got 4DX tickets, whoever asks questions and shit. Um, you'll be able to... Look at that, man. Please face the camera. Aztec Batman. It's so fucking dope. It's gorgeous, man. Gorgeous. The good people at Sideshow. Thanks to the good folks at Sideshow. So that's going to be... Who gets that? Uh, we need a metric for that. Maybe it's the furthest question asker? Furthest question oh, yeah. asker? Fair enough. Not the best. I can't get this poster back in, but you know it's there. All right, kids, lots of shit to give away. If you've never been, if you're at home and you're like, oh, my God, they give away free shit. Yes, we do. So make sure you come when we do the show uh, live. Of course, we'll be doing it here at the Scum and Villainy Cantina in 2024, uh, probably in January. Mm -hmm. And we'll be back at uh, Smod Castle Cinemas doing it probably Sometime March, spring. February, March. Maybe we'll do it before the cruise. Maybe we'll do the Ides of Mark. There again. it is. Ides of Mark 2. Um, okay. Boogaloo. Uh, JC picks the question so that me and Mark uh, don't, you know, have to do the Sophie's Choice of it all. You figure out who we're talking to. Who's the first one? I, uh, I think the name is Roy Ayala. Ayala? Roy, where are you at? Come on there up, Roy. Go. Give it up for Roy, man. Is it Roy or Ray? Ray. Ray. Give it up for Ray. Well done, DeBamp man. Ray, give it up for Ray, everybody. Hello, Ray. Hey, Roy. Hello. No. <laughs> what do you got, Ray? If you could be the wonk of any type of candy or food, what would it be and how would you design your factory? If I could be the wonka Ooh. of any candy or food, what a great fucking question. I would be the wonka of hummus. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the least popular factory. <laughs> exactly. Factory no kids want to go there, man. Um, I'm, I'm pretty damn good at making hummus from scratch. So I would be that guy. I'd be like, if you want to view hummus. Uh, the king of the chickpeas, they'd call me and shit. Uh, so yeah, that's, I'd go hummus. You? Um, I feel like you need a thing that has uh, a possibility for variety, right? Cause you can make a few different hummuses. <laughs> you can. They're all paste. <laughs> um, I think I want to be the, the Wonka of pizza. Oh. I think you got... That's a popular choice. Why I, didn't I think of that shit? I think because you don't eat that shit anymore. Well, I can eat pizza. It just can't be real cheese. It's got to be like vegan cheese. And it's got to be like cauliflower crust. Basically, it's got to be not pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, and of course, we would have the saddest vegan pizza room in the factory where it's just like a bunch of... Like, <laughs> That's where you'll find Kev Smith. <laughs> What are you doing? <laughs> Making the fake cheese. I got all this sorghum powder and gelatin. and it's, it's, It feels like cheese. It's not cheese, though. They do shit with cashews now. <laughs> I mean, they've been doing shit with cashews for a thousand years. And I don't know it <laughs> was cheese. True. Suddenly it's cheese. <laughs> Suddenly um, it's cheese. Pizza. What an excellent fucking choice. Yeah, you got your, your deep dish, your Sicilian, your square pies, your white pies. You got all kinds of different ideas. And again, everybody Sorry. loves it. And, and a kid would want to take over a pizza factory. Absolutely. No so kid is fucking like trying to beat other kids to take over a hummus factory. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. pizza is the better choice. We got a Hot Pockets room down there. Oh my God. You're absolutely right. <laughs> and you get the teens and the 20-somethings oh, as well. We got them all. Fucking hummus. What was I thinking, man? <laughs> I really got to think harder on these before I just spit out an answer. I'm like, I'm good at hummus. Fucking you know dumb. what? Crackers. It's <laughs> your crackers factory. Um, great fucking question, man. Uh, you get to walk with a bag. Take one of these fucking bags. Give bag. it up for, for Ray. And a book. And the book. Take this, take this, take this. You could also do the pizza rolls. 
it's, part it, under that, too. I mean, too. like, there's 98 different kinds of pieces. You got your flatbreads, you got your Detroit style. You we got all know we have a superior style. answer. Don't fucking rub it in, man. But I will point this out. You can do hummus puffs as well. Uh, okay. Uh, Vincent Soprano. Vincent Soprano. Give it up for Vincent, everybody. Vincent also... He typed his, his thing up. <laughs> wow. Did you type it out in advance? Well done, Vincent. Yeah, he made fun of me last time for doing that. Is it like a four-part question? What, what was that? Is it like a four-part question? No, it's one sentence. He just wants it to be legible. Yeah. And he got chosen, so yeah. Yeah. good plan. I also write like six questions. So did you submit that the many? odds? <laughs> My odds favorite. Are good. It's like the yeah. Barton Fink of questions. <laughs> uh, so he picked this one. So who or what is on your 2023 naughty and nice list? Who or what is on my 2023 naughty and nice list? Um, you go first. I got to think of some. Why do I have to go first? Because <laughs> I'm always going first. When it gets hard, you go first. Uh, it sounds exactly as filthy as I fucking meant it. I feel like... Now, are these like real people you want? Or like characters? Or, or anything from 2023. That anything from 2023. That you loved and you hated. So you're naughty and nice from 2023. Okay. All right. Aside from your list. Um, I, my, my nice list, I guess, I'll say it was Comic-Con this past year. Hmm. Um, it was kind of lovely to return back to kind of inform um, where 100,000 people showed up and it was very much a comic book convention because everybody was kind of on strike and so the promotional part of it wasn't there. The lines around the block to get into Hall H to watch actors sit on a stage and talk about the movies that you'll see in three months. All that was gone. So it was about the books again. It was about community again. It was about the, the world of fandom in the way that we kind of love it and being able to reconnect with that after a pandemic and after whatever was just, it was kind of wonderful to be back there again. Um, my naughty list? I don't know, man, I really didn't like Rebel Moon. But, um, <laughs> but it feels like really tough to just tee off on it now. When Rebel Moon, else. is that? Uh, it's, it's playing at the Egyptian theater. You went to the movies to I see it? I went to the movies to see it. Wow. In 70 millimeter Holy at shit. the Egyptian. Because that Netflix bought that theater. They own the Egyptian now. So, now so wait, they, they played a 70 millimeter print? Yeah, they made up, they struck a print of that movie to show at the Egyptian. They got all the money, don't they? Yeah. Um, How'd it go? Uh, I mean, the theater's lovely. <laughs> I mean, it's 100 years old. It's, when's, it, when's it on Netflix? Uh, I feel like it's like Friday. I think it's like it drops Thursday? Thursday. Comes? Thursday. Yeah, early for Christmas. What's the people, what's the, and what's the word? Um, the word is... Um, we don't, we don't, word, well, what's, what, is, what is the rest of the world saying? What are you saying? So far, the rest of the world, uh, there, there's two parts of the world. There's the part of the world that does not love Zack Snyder movies or does not, does not subscribe to the Zack Snyder way of life. They're like, whatever. And then the people who do are like, oh my God, it's like Lawrence of Arabia. Okay. Uh, it is probably somewhere in the middle but not closer to the Lawrence of Arabia part of that conversation. But I ran into a guy who drove in from Vegas on Friday to see a noon, the first matinee, because he just, and he had the Zack That's Snyder jacket. Awesome. And I was like, boot, I'm not gonna yuck your yum, man. If you enjoyed that movie, power to you. You drove from Vegas, you must have left at 6 a.m. to get here by 11 to see this movie at 12. That's love, and I can't detract you right from there. that love. I do not share your love. And he's like, oh, I know, I'll wait for the show. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not gonna do that because that would be just kicking a baby in the teeth that it doesn't have yet. <laughs> um, I don't know. You go. I gotta think of a nasty thing. Nice. Uh, who's on my nice list? You know, there's a lot of people who sacrifice uh, a lot of their time and lives uh, to make mine smooth and make mine happen and when I go oh, I want to do a thing like they make it happen they help me make it happen and stuff and when people dream your dreams for and with you that's just about the most beautiful gesture in the world so um, you know like there's 
so many people in, in my life. In, in this room, of course, Mark, J, JC, uh, Andrew, um, but people like uh, Jason's wife, Jordan, like literally fucking runs our business and, and does it tirelessly while she's got two kids. You know, she just had a kid this year and stuff. Uh, Chelsea, who works uh, with us in our office and has for, for years. Um, Luke, Jake, uh, who work like at the website and stuff. Mike Zapsick and everybody back at the Secret Stash. Uh, these are, you know, the nice people that allow me to live the life that I en enjoy living. Uh, Boy Jordan, who is my agent slash manager, the one who gets me jobs and shit like that. Uh, and then this year, you know, it's been a lot. It's, this year is a tough fucking year. And if I had to pick an, somebody for the naughty list, like I'd probably put myself on it. It was a it was a Aww. tough fucking year for our hero. And uh, at one point. Uh, we might remember I was in uh, a facility, you know, I was, this was such a long year that I spent the beginning of it at Sierra Tucson. And all the people there are on my nice list because, you know, they saved my life and gave me some technology to deal with a world that sometimes feels overwhelming and I know everyone feels that as well. And I just had the luxury and the wherewithal to take time out and go fix my head and they helped me do that so all those cats in sierra tucson uh are on my nice list uh, i'm doing a show here today and feeling fucking normal and good because of the work that they did and they, they'll be the first ones to say like you put in the work but it was it was them they 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 saved me uh so yes thank you to them um uh, Josh Rausch, uh, who shoots so much of our stuff um, and, and uh, helps me make my dreams come true. Jason Muse, uh, Ralph Garman, uh, Andy McElfrish, uh, Jennifer, of course, um, uh, you know, Harley even. Um, Harley's boyfriend this year, Austin, way on my nice list. He's the lead in the movie we made and he's fucking phenomenal and he gave one of these performances like while we were making the flick I had young actors uh, like four kids in their early 20s and stuff and they were all so fucking serious like while we were making the movie I'm like look at these kids like there's at one point there's a fight scene because there's always a fight scene in a Kevin Smith movie but not physical people argue there's always a, like, a third act fight right um, so there's a third act fight in this and these kids like poured themselves into it. Like between takes, they were like psyching each other up and shit like that, like it was a wrestling match. And I remember sitting there going like, oh my God, like oh, just pretend, just hit the mark and say snoochie boochies, that's what the other guy does. Like <laughs> fucking, why are they taking it so seriously? And then I'd sit there every day and edit the footage and I was like, oh, that's why you treat it seriously. Like they gave these truly beautiful performances. Um, and I've said it before other places, I'll say it again. The script that I wrote, I like it. But it's not like the, the it's it's not the strongest script I ever wrote. It's very sweet, um, very warm, but it doesn't like fucking. It doesn't do what Dogma does. Doesn't do what even fucking Jane Silent Bob reboot does or Clerks Three or anything like that. It's more of a, a feels movie. It's all about like what it was like to be 16 in 1986 and love movies and shit like that. So I always felt like going into every other movie, I was like, the script is the strongest element we have. I didn't give a shit who was in the cast. I was like, they all come together because of the script. The script's the best element. This time out was the first time I ever made a movie where I was like, the script's good, but that's not what's gonna make this movie. What's gonna make this movie is the cast. If the cast is fucking charming, if the cast is effervescent and shit, that's what's gonna carry us. And thank God they did. And not only were they charming and effervescent, but all that reality, all that anguish they put into like fucking feeling things or having their character feel things, like panned out. Like it, it was a smart choice and shit. So I told them all, like, while well, after in post, I was like, you know, kids, when we were making that movie, I thought you're all so silly for trying so hard. And they're like, thanks. I was like, but it really panned out. Like, you, because of you, the movie is what it is. It's only be is what it is because of you. So those uh, kids, uh, which would be Austin, Nick, Reed, and Sienna, they're definitely on, on my nice list this year as well. 
uh, Ron, who shot our movie. I could go on and on and on, man. And all of you, everyone at home. I put up a video about mental health this year. I heard from so many fucking wonderful people. I still hear from people everywhere I go, in real life, online, about like, thank you for sharing that and stuff like that. So thank you to, to all of you who've been uh, patient uh, with uh, me for the course of the last year. Uh, I went on a journey and, uh, and you know, I'm, I think the ship has been righted, so to speak. So thank you for your faith, for your support, for the kind words and shit like that. Uh, and top of my nice list is my mom, because I almost lost her fucking three times this year. And uh, yeah, she went through some bad fucking incidences in the hospital and stuff. And at one point they told us like, look into hospice care. And I was just with her the other day and she's doing fucking great. So she's the top of my nice list. Without her, I don't fucking exist. So hats off to mom. Um, Who's your naughty? Um, I, it, it's, it's funny. There, there's a version of this where I could have picked both my naughty and my nice list as the WGA strike, <clears throat> which was the, the nice of it was the spirit, was the camaraderie, was that feeling of a bunch of people pulling a boat in the same direction for progress and for change and for advancement and for value. Um, and then the flip side of that was the studios, was the AMPTP, the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, who could have ended the strike whenever they wanted to and decided it needed to go 148 days to make people hurt. And that the level of cruelty involved in, in sustaining a, a thing they knew they were going to have to do. It was a deal they were going to have to make and the fact that it took them six months to do it feels somewhat misanthropic. Um, or naughty. Or, or naughty. Yeah. Uh, and not good naughty. Um, Granted, we all have to go back to work together and we have to be in rooms with folks and we have to do business with folks. Um, but that, that, was a, that was a stretch of time when you know, our, our partners had kind of broken faith with what we were doing and why we were doing it and chose to punish us for standing up for ourselves. And you know, that we do not forget. Um, sobering answers, but true answers and stuff. Indeed. Uh, but a great question. Awesome. Give it up. Thank you, sir. For the soprano single. Thank you. You also got to give that stuff away. We will. All right. Those would be bone. Those would be honorable mentions. Oh, well, that's what we're doing. There's like nine of them. <laughs> uh, what do we got, JC? Uh, last one, Jesse Campbell. Jesse, come on up. Everyone, give it up for Jesse. They just did. What are your what are your favorite holiday specials? Ooh, holiday wow. specials. Um, okay, let's see. I was a big ranking bass or bass. How do you say it? Bass, bass right? Bass um, for your face. I know, bass. Uh, ranking bass, uh, bass, bass fan uh, when I was a kid. So that's your, of course, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Um, uh, and Santa Claus is coming to town. Year without a Santa Claus. Year without a Santa Claus, but also the Easter one. So mm -hmm. here comes Peter Cottontail. Uh, also the, you know, the little, they did Nestor, the long-eared donkey. That's right. Um, so those are tied directly into my childhood. You know, most of them aired on CBS and had that special thing that did did dun 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 where you're like, oh shit, we're going to see some quality programming. And it was followed by some holiday fucking special that still lives in my head and heart. Um, you know, I, I'd be right now. There's a documentary about the Star Wars Christmas special that you can watch online. It's streaming. You can buy it. And, uh, I don't know where. Maybe it's on Apple or something like that. Uh, that uh, Adam Goldberg produced, uh, or is one of the producers on, and they go deep on the Christmas special. But I only saw that once in my childhood because they didn't air it ever again. And then I saw it later on in life when I had a bootleg copy. But it didn't. Like, I don't, when I think of that, I don't think of Christmas. I think of, like, wow, fucking, I can't believe they said yes. Um, so, I, you know, it's mostly the, the Rankin Bass stuff, even more so than the Peanuts stuff. And I, I, I was a huge Peanuts fan, still am, and watched all of that. But the Rankin Bass stuff, that just, it, it feels like a happy childhood. Like, it feels like, you know, back then we couldn't watch what we wanted when we wanted. So you had once a year to watch it. They didn't rerun it. It's not like, we'll run it again in the summer because it was holiday programming. So it was event programming. 
like must-see TV. You had to be there to see it, otherwise you were going to miss it before the era of the VCR. So that ties deeply into my childhood when things were a lot more precious. Now the culture is very disposable. I'm not saying things were better then and things suck now, not at all. But now you have access to everything you've ever wanted. You know, there was a time where in 1979 they played Jaws on ABC. Maybe it was 80 or something like that. But it was like four or five years after it was ever in theaters and shit. And when it played on ABC, I had a tape recorder and I tape recorded the whole fucking movie so I could listen to it. It was long before we had VHSs and shit like that. Everything, you know, because it, it was scarce, and particularly holiday programming, which they would run seasonally once and not rerun, felt more special and loomed large in my life as a child. And because of that, they have wonderful resonating memories. Now, when was the last time I watched a Rankin Bass thing? Fucking easily pre clerks. But they still live right here. Um, not enough for me to try to pass them on to my kid when she was young because they wouldn't have worked on her. Like the shit that she liked was, you know, she was in a Pixar and shit like that. I'm like, look at these puppets. She would have been like, fuck no. So it's still something that like I share with other people my age. Um, it, quite like uh, the, the uh, peanut specials of my youth. Um, they didn't seem to translate as well to fel following generations. I don't know any kids that talk about the Rankin Bass stuff anymore, even Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Um, so because of that, that stuff, it burns brighter because it's so fucking precious. But again, I don't want this to be like, oh man, fucking like shit was better when I was younger. I'm not saying it's better, it was just different. And it was special because it was rare. Now, you know, they've got, now they just came out with Urkel Saves Christmas, which is about, I don't know, 20 years late, but eventually they got around to it. It gives me hope that in 10 years, Jay and Silent Bob will save Christmas as well. But there's so much for everybody. Yo, yeah. do that. Yes. Like, Believe me, once I saw Urkel do it, I was like, we're next. Because um, like, they'll play it every year. True. Like, so true. Like every, every music artist, whether they want to or not, cuts a Christmas album. Because you can never tell, like, you could be Mariah Carey and have this song that will always play, yeah. or just be like John Legend has four Christmas albums. None of them are great, but, like, they're out there because you might want to hear him sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, because True. he got a decent voice. Like, Bobby McFerrin has a Christmas album, because of course he does. Don't worry, be Christmas. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's what it is. Um, Don't worry, be merry. It's a good plan. Just do it. Do yeah, it. Sooner do, or later. Do an hour-long special, man. Just do it. <laughs> Point being, though, they'll cater to every single appetite there is for a holiday special now. Back then, they made one a year if you were lucky. And chances are they made a thing and you just watched it ten years fucking straight. Um, yeah. So that would be mine. Yours? I will die on the hill of humanity's finest achievement is The Grinch yeah. by Chuck Jones. It's wonderful. Like, it is, it's, it's perfect. Yeah. You know, it is, it is some of the best, A, just craft-wise, some of the best animation out there, but story-wise, the, the, the liberties it takes with the original story, the voice work, you know, throw Ravencroft doing the singing, Boris Karloff doing the narration, like, all of that stuff is so great. Um, it's, it has become the thing that I have to see every Christmas season, or it's not quite Christmas. Um, meanwhile, the other half of my family, my wife, watches all of it. Like, my DVR is filled with the shittiest Christmas stuff with you can imagine. It is like wall-to-wall -wall Hallmark Christmas movies and all the Rankin Bass stuff and Peanuts and like even the like prep and landing, like the stuff that they made in like the mid 2000s for those kids who needed CGI stuff. Right. Like I'm sure we're gonna watch Elf 400 times before in the next week, A Christmas Story. My wife has to watch Sound of Music or it's not Christmas because same for her, <laughs> so, they only ever put that on TV yeah. during Christmas. And so it became part of her Christmas spirit. I'm like, I don't wanna watch these young Nazis fall in love. She's like, I have to! <laughs> I have to watch it! <laughs> I can't do it anymore. But The Grinch, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, is, it always will sing a song in my heart. Honorable mention, not a kid's program, Scrooged. I watch that every fucking year. This is one of my favorite Christmas stories. I, I, I mean, it's funny throughout, but it's, I, I find it incredibly emotional at the end. Mm. And I've tried to live my life like 
like Frank Cross, Bill Murray's character, in the last 10 minutes of Scrooge. <laughs> like where you come to, the, where you get to that place where you're like, I understand. Like he's so jubilant. That is one of my favorite monologues in cinema history. Mm. And from the way I understand it, he ad libbed most of it, like wow. just to the camera and stuff. I love Scrooge. Um, in any event, great fucking question. You get a bag and a book, come get it, man. Give it up for Jesse. Well done. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, no, no, no. Fucking put that. You got a bag and a book. You don't get that. Fucking greedy motherfucker. It's Christmas. <laughs> um, for the Aztec back, man. How about uh, we'll do, let's, let's do uh, who came furthest? We can do that. Although that person then has to carry it back with him wherever they <laughs> still came. That's true. I'm from New Zealand. Well, good luck getting that on a plane, sir. All right. Who came closest? <laughs> yeah. uh, what do you think? Or should we just vote on a person? Um, I don't know. What do you think, Jason? Yeah, what you, it's your bar. Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I'm sure it's scintillating uh, streaming online, watching this on the YouTube feed as we think about who should get this present that nobody else will get. Oh, not, not in this. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Say again? Bid thirty. We're not selling it. <laughs> Come on, it's got to be a gift. I let. Let's do. Let's. Let's do. Who came the farthest? Okay, fair who enough. Who came the furthest? Uh, all right. Who thinks they came the furthest? Yeah. Anybody outside of California? All right, Montana. we got a couple over there. Where? Montana. All right, well, hold on. Put your hands together if you're not from California. Seattle. Put your hands together real quick. If you're not from California, clap. Sounds like you're working this table only. I think so. We got Seattle. Can you beat Seattle? Originally Israel. But you didn't but fly you mean- from Tel Aviv. And this is Montana. Montana, Seattle. Can anybody beat Montana? No? Going once? Twice? Virginia! That's the East Coast. Wait, did you come to California from Virginia, or did you come for this? <laughs> just say this. <laughs> <laughs> um, really? My boyfriend Virginia, what part of Virginia? Virginia Beach? Virginia Beach. All right. I mean, that's far, man. I think that wins, that's unless we got somebody international. Anybody beating Virginia? Virginia going once. Virginia going twice. Sold! Virginia, well done. You guys win the bat- Aztec Batman. So close. I mean, Virginia's not close to Seattle, but you were this close. Um, all right, how do we give away the rest of this shit? I don't know. You throw it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> who, has, who saw the flash in theaters? Who saw the flash two times in the theater? Who saw the flash three times in the theater? Fucking A, man. So did I. Wait, I could win. Who saw it? So there's two of you. How many times did you see it? Five? What do you have? Do you want the flash Hold poster? on, hold on. You've seen it five times? Come up and defend this movie. That's how you win the giant flash yes. poster. Five times. You must have seen something people right. didn't. As a, as a big um, fan of yourself. Thank you. And John Schnepp. You know John Schnepp? I watch Death of Superman Lives all the time. Yeah. The Thanagarian snare beast came to life. It did. On film. It did. And Nick Cage it. was not happy about it, yeah. but it did. <laughs> I, and I love that moment. I love every little Easter egg, even though obviously the CGI has issues. But I just. So they said. I, I love what they tried to, to do. Yeah. Fair. What was your favorite part? Uh, just the scene. Yeah, the scene where we saw all the DC characters, even in their shitty forms, but <laughs> saw, you know, all the history of DC. I loved it. Um, and if you had this, would you sell it on eBay? It's, it's going on my wall forever. This would go up on your wall proudly? Yeah. Are yeah, you serious? serious? <laughs> Don't. It's going to be expensive, yeah. man. <laughs> I've framed giant posters before, and when they present the bill, I'm like, why did I fucking do that? Put it on the Four ceiling. On the cheap. ceiling over your bed. That's right. Looking down at you forever, man. Uh, I, I don't want to think of Ezra that much, but I want to think of all the other guys. Watching over <laughs> yes. here. Just look at Batman. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, I, I, I don't watch the whole movie, but I have gone back and watched all the Michael Keaton parts. 
within the last month. The Keaton cut. Yeah. If I was to, if I did a, the Keaton cut, if I did my list of ten things, mm -hmm. Michael Keaton Batman would have been in the top five. I, I enjoyed seeing Michael Keaton come back and play Batman again. I know it didn't work out, but fuck, I loved it. Um, it's going to work out for you. You win the poster. Give it up. Thank for you me. so much. Excellent job. If you need rubber bands, there's some rubber yeah, bands. Yeah, there's a couple rubber bands we took off. Uh, we got Stormtrooper Pop. How do we do this, Jason? Stormtrooper Pop. Uh, you oh, mentioned, take it. You mentioned uh, Disturbance in the Force, which is the holiday special there's documentary. There's a documentary about uh, the Star Wars Christmas special. It's called Disturbance in the Force. Who, who in here has seen it? Yeah, yeah. A handful okay. of people. Okay. Uh, uh oh. Now trivia about mm -hmm. disturbance. I yeah, trivia. Uh, name one of the three people who are in that documentary that was filmed in this bar. I'm standing right here, and you go with Seth fucking Green first. You were filmed at Smod Castle. I wasn't here. You weren't. You Sorry, were here. I for you. <laughs> <laughs> are you serious? Yeah, you were at Smod Castle. You were here for last blockbuster. That's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. He got all three. Taron Killam was here? And who was the other one? Bonnie Burton, who was... Uh, and I wasn't here. No. No. I feel like Nicholson in The Shining. I feel like I've always been here. <laughs> um, all, right. I, all right. So somebody just won the pop. All right. So Jeff gets the... Give it up, man. Jeff won the pop. Heels Ultimate Shave Collection, kids. Comes with invigorating uh, gel cleanser, brushless uh, shave cream, smoothing aftershave cream, and energizing non-greasy moisturizer, man. It's all for your asshole. Who wants that? <laughs> Four things for shaving. Uh, clearly, uh, I mean, uh, it's anybody who shaves. <laughs> for Kevin Conroy? You were, you're, look, you're a winner without winning, but take that. Give it up for Kev. He won that, man. <laughs> this is, a, a, I guess, a lanyard or a keychain, and it's got stormtroopers on it. Who likes stormtroopers? Bang. <laughs> it's got very, like, it's the jerk. Like, I'm not going anywhere without my lanyard, without my cum towel, without this Funko Pop. And like he said, we come to the cum towel, kids. Here's the cum towel. Um, it's got a stormtrooper on it, um, and it's from the good folks at Panasonic, who I'm sure are like, please don't uh, call it a cum towel. <laughs> Who's the youngest person in the bar? <gasps> what a, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you self-serving motherfucker. <laughs> hey, new fan to the show. I hear you like stormtroopers. He wants it? I don't need it. Merry Christmas, I don't, Mark. Oh, thank you. I don't, I don't have that kind of stamina anymore. <laughs> um, and don't forget, you have to figure out what you want on a pair of sneakers. Oh, no. We'll, no, 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 no. Um, all right. Did we give out all our shit? I think we gave out all our shit. And we don't have anything else? You have your vans back. Those are mine. I, I take those. Nobody gets my vans. Shit. That's it. We're out of show. We did it. How many hours was that? Uh, oh, damn. Almost three. Just shy of three. Oh, we got to keep it going until we hit three. <laughs> <laughs> Just to go out on an even number, I would imagine. Um, anybody else got anything they want to ask before we get out of here? Go ahead. Yeah. What? You're, you're eating airwaves. I heard, yeah, and then... Go ahead, fire away. Yes. Uh, what um, sci-fi or comic book story would you set during a holiday? What holiday would that be? Um, uh, in the spirit of how Die Hard is considered by most to be a holiday or Christmas movie and stuff, what holiday would we choose to do? Yeah. To set a comic book or superhero science fiction movie during. Is that I, right? Okay. I'd do a movie and call it Iron Man 3. Yeah. <laughs> They already have that, though. At Christmas. 
But that's, you know, it's debatable, but it's at Christmas. I mean, every, every Shane Black movie is set during Christmas. It's set during Christmas. Um, let me see. Groot on Arbor Day. <laughs> nice. Um, Sergeant Rock on Veterans Day. Ooh, nice, nice. Uh, Not as nice as Groot, but I nice. mean, no, it's really good. <laughs> really good. Um, all right, well, there you go. <laughs> we did it. Look at that. Go ahead. Thank you read the you read the, Koi loves comics, so you actually read that comic and shit. Um, Quick stops, uh, volume two, issue one. It, uh, it starts the movie origin story. I thought of that like I started writing it uh, like a year and a half ago or something like that, um, because I'd finished like the 4:30 movie and the 4:30 movie was so squeaky clean. I was like, I gotta fucking dirty it up. So I wrote the movie story next. Um, but it's all predicated on one line from Dogma which is uh, when, when Loki and Bartleby walk into the movie's boardroom and ben, Ben's character, uh, Bartleby, tells the origin story of movie, The Golden Calf, to the boardroom where he's like, movie, The Golden Calf, created in 19-something by uh, Nancy Goldruff, a uh, kindergarten teacher, and then he goes on and that's it. So that one line is the basis for all four issues of the miniseries. It's the Nancy Goldrift story. And um, it, it's so fucked up. Um, <laughs> the first issue, as you see, ends in a real like, what the fuck? Issue two is even more weird. Issue three is just fucking, I shouldn't have written it. Uh, and issue four brings it home on a more human level and stuff. But uh, yeah, it, has, it hasn't, that name has existed since Dogma, but the idea for this only about a year and a half ago. Do I have any... Any other thing you want to extrapolate into NC-17 because comics are so forgiving? Anything I want to extrapolate into NC-17 because comics are so forgiving, meaning like how I took movie and turned it dirty? Yeah, because it's you know, like that depravity with... Um... <laughs> no. <laughs> I, no. I got in, yeah, no, I got in so much trouble last time for joking. Um, no, nothing. <laughs> Smart. Yeah, thank you. Just nothing, fly. nothing whatsoever. <laughs> One of, uh, one of the big questions in chat tonight, and we yes. might not want to go there, but um, was, I guess, Kanye sampled Dogma? Did you know this? Uh, some, I've, I haven't heard it, but somebody told me that uh, there was a track that uh, was dropped, him and somebody else. It wasn't just him by himself. Um, there's another artist and they, as well. Yeah, I guess he sampled, sampled Jay and Silent Bob from Dogma. A line from Dogma, from, from Dogma with, with Jay talking. I heard. I haven't heard it yet. It's um, all over Reddit. But I, I did see a bunch of people online going like, like, did they ask? And I'm like, no. <laughs> uh, so I don't, you know, I don't know how Muse feels about it because it's his voice. Um, but yeah, it exists out there in the world. Well, it wouldn't Sorry. be you anyway. It'd be whoever owns Dogma, right? Well, I mean, that's the thing. It's like when you sample a song, you know who has the song. But when you sample somebody doing dialogue in a movie, yes, somebody owns the movie, but then there's also the element of that somebody's performance. So is Jay, like, really rich? Because he's a, I was going to say, like, Jay, or maybe, I don't know if Jay has a lawsuit on his hands or not. <laughs> I, I don't know how that shit works and stuff. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's his voice. Well, I figure if it's like music, then it would be whoever's got the publishing rights, right? Whoever owns the masters. Yeah, but in music, it's usually a, a musical hook that has nobody singing or nobody's voice in it, generally speaking. Depends. Like Kanye's sampled Ray Charles in the past. Like there's so who Otis gets the Redding. money there? I think depending on who owns that particular library, the owner of the library would be the person they'd have to clear it with. But if it's like Taylor but Swift. Taylor Swift needs to grant you the license. But even if somebody has the public, like so, let's say somebody owns Ray Charles's publishing, which I'm sure they do, right. and it may not be Ray Charles. Don't you then also, if you're using Ray Charles's voice, doesn't matter who owns the publishing, don't you also have to ask the artist, can, can I use your voice? In addition to this specific clip, you are also a separate element. I, I don't think, like when Michael Jackson bought the Beatles, catalog yes he was the one they had to go to to get revolution for ads for all the publishing for all, right 
So like they don't have to go to like Lennon or McCartney or their estates to get a song to put on a Nike ad. They just, just got to right pay to Michael him. Jackson. Is that right? Yeah. Like that's that's the ups and downs of it. Like you get paid a fortune for it. Right. But you then give up control of it when you do that. Uh, Jason hey, Mewes, if you're watching, you're fucked. <laughs> There's no money for you. Uh, I have a, a sweet story. All right. Uh, so I <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Bam Bam with a sweet story. Give it up for him. He owns the bar. Give it up for him right now. I, uh, <clears throat> my daughter, we converted my garage to like my studio. And I have all my toys and stuff in there. For her, it's like if she knew what Toys R Us was, that's what my garage is. And uh, she went out and wanted to play superheroes today. And I had the hardest moment in my life because she pulled all of my superpowers toys and wanted to play superheroes with Batman and Robin and the Penguin. Vintage editions? <laughs> Vintage and my mint condition Batmobile. Um, <laughs> so it's that like moment of like, oh my God, don't touch these. Like, I got these in 1984. Stop it. But it's also my daughter wants to play with Batman and Robin with me. So we, we played with my superhero toys today for like Th that's, 25 look minutes. Look at that. You grew up. <laughs> that was your bar mitzvah. Today you are a man because you were like, you know what? Let the kid play with these yeah. toys. <laughs> Daddy, why are you crying? Isn't it fun? It's the best. <laughs> yeah, just like, no, it's not. <laughs> if I'm 100% honest, I was like, if she breaks it, I can buy it on eBay. Yeah, that's the that, thing. Was, that was my Now we live in a world coping. where it's like you could find it again. Um, you know, but also, you're going to gonna have to figure out you've got the hero toys and then the stunt toys. And so you buy the ones that like, this cost me $4 and it's not the real deal and doesn't have to be. And then you keep the hero toys in the closet. Yeah, I, yeah, I need to move them up higher on the shelf. <laughs> what that's I what it comes to down to. Um, adorable. Yeah, my kid did that as well. Just last week, she was 24. <laughs> I was like, you know exactly how valuable they are. She's like, let's play, Dad. <laughs> I couldn't say no. <laughs> um, shit, I think yeah, we're done. I think we should get out of here. I think we're out of show. Did we hit the three-hour mark? Yeah. Yes. Hey, we did it, kids. Three hours. <laughs> About an hour of quality, but three hours of quantity, man. Did y'all have a good time this week? Yeah. Have y'all had a good time this year? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Did you enjoy your last ever podcast, buddy? He's never coming back here. Yeah, like, what'd you, what'd you think of fucking Pops? Fire, Fire right? Fire. It's a compliment. That's a compliment. That's what uh, you can say when that's a good thing. Do we want to reveal the... Comics that are in your comic bag for 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 after. Should um, we click stop the stream and then? I get. I mean, I guess we could. We'll do that afterwards. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that feels like we're housekeeping. We can do that. Not on the show. People at home will be like, "What the fuck's going on?" <laughs> um, you'll see. I don't know if you've noticed this week, but the bar is clean. Generally, the bar is always filled with shit that we have to sign. We don't have to, but we do and stuff. And we all made a collective decision that we should really concentrate on the show. So that's what we did. Um, and I got to say, like... You feel all right? Yeah, it was helpful to not be like, uh-huh, yes, what? Because you know, you're signing shit. So, yeah, only if we could help. stop reading the chat. I mean, that's the thing. When he was like, when he mentioned chat, I was like, oh my God. Like, I normally, like, when we do the home shows, I'm riding chat, but I didn't even think. How was chat tonight? Um, they loved the show. Oh. I got a lot of crap. For Jar Jar? No. no you surprisingly. Uh, a lot goes into the show yeah. when we do it live. A lot more than we would do it at home. Yes. And people are like, the mic levels and the this and the that and the this and the that. I was like, I got in here. We haven't done a show in seven or eight months here. And I Is think that right? June or July, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. And you're right. Either just and before or just after Comic-Con. Every yeah. single piece of video equipment needed, like, a firmware update and stuff. And so, like, like I'm like, we got the show. It's going to air. And everybody's like, it, 
fucking sounds terrible. And I was like, I can't believe the computer updated in time. So outside of that, outside of that. Um, yeah, I, yeah sometimes people complain, like, we don't hear you as well, but... I know. also, look, like, Joe, Free show for Joe Rogan has 80 people who work on his show. We have, like, me and Andrew. So, like, I kind of like the home feeling of the show. You know, I always, when I think of you, I think of Joe Rogan, too. <laughs> <laughs> I just, Guys are the Ke same, same, just the same podcast. Ke Kevin's now on my naughty list for comparing <laughs> me to Joe Rogan. Um, shit, I, I, feel, I, feel, I feel like we're stolen. We, we hit the three, we, the clock ticked over. I know, I guess we gotta it's, go. We're about to be pumpkins again. Um, folks, uh, thank you at home. Thank you everybody here in the room, man. We made it another year with Fat Man Beyond. Absolutely. It's never guaranteed. It's never guaranteed that it's, it's never, another year. No, and honestly, like, it's, it's really uh, special. I've talked about liking the show so much, but uh, what happens is you get a sense of object permanence uh, when you do a lot of things. And you're like, oh, this will go on forever. And they don't. Everything has its time. And, uh, you know, there are things that, I don't get to do anymore. Case in point, like, and I'm, I'm not, I don't miss it. And I'm, I, when it was over, I was glad it was over because I'd done it a lot. But for five years, I interviewed people for IMDb at Sundance and at San Diego Comic Con. And um, I don't, like, miss it. I'm not like, oh, I wish I could do that again. But r lately, I've been like, oh, that, that's a whole era that's happened and done, and I won't go down that path probably ever again and stuff. But, like, how special it was and stuff. This is, I don't take this show for granted. As much as I enjoy it, I don't feel like this will go on forever. This will always be there because I now have so many examples in my life of things that I thought would go on forever that fucking didn't. And so now I appreciate them so much more while they're happening because you never know how long they're going to happen. This show makes me so happy. Doing it whether we do it home, whether we do it here, whether we do it at Smod Castle. Um, I truly hope it never ends, but I'm glad that it ever happened at all, and it, I was glad that it happened this year, because as much as people may like to watch us sit around and fucking talk about pop culture, uh, it's therapeutic. I needed this show this year, and so I was glad it was here. Thank you all for being a part of our... Our, our dream of fucking talking about shit we have nothing to do with. Um, we could do it on a Zoom. We could do it in the room. We could do it in a coat. We could do it on a boat. Fucking A. And we will do it on a boat in like two months. Excellent fucking point. Oh my God, what a hell of a segue. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in February, are you looking for a Christmas gift for some fucking Kevin Smith fan? You're like, what do I get him? Go on the cruise, man. Jay and Silent Bob's Cruise is Q. Me and Mark are going to be on it, doing Fat Man uh, Beyond There. Me and Ralph doing Hollywood Babylon. Me and Jay doing Jay and Silent Bob. Get old. Me and Andy doing uh, Education. Me and Jen doing Plus One. Uh, plus, we've got uh, 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 Brian O'Halloran, Jeff Anderson, Jason Lee, Ethan Suplee, me and Muse, uh, a whole bunch of cats going to be on Jay and Silent Bob's Cruises Q. Uh, leaves from Miami, goes to Bahamas three days. You go, you come back. It's 3,000 of us. I think we're at 80 or 85% sold at this point or something going to be a good fucking time. That's like right around the bend. Uh, so you can watch me and Mark do this on the high seas. We probably won't be streaming that episode <laughs> because we'll be in international waters and shit, <laughs> which means we could have knife fights. Um, <laughs> so you'll miss the most exciting Fat Man Beyond of all time. But uh, if you're into that sort of thing, kids, you want to join us on the high seas, go to Jay and Silent Bob's CruisesQ.com uh, and join up and stuff. Well done. Well remembered. Learn uh, from the master. Thank you. Uh, do Come on. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm <laughs> um, Own what, it. What, no, I was, I, was, I was like, am I truly? And then I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm good at it. Here, I, I'll tell you why I pause. I'm coming to I use a the word master? No. Did I make it weird? 
No, but you just <laughs> did now. <laughs> <laughs> that hadn't occurred to me. Oh, my God. What occurred to me is I'm like, I'm at a weird crossroads threshold point with me and podcasting. Because uh, there's this moment where I could lean in. And mind you, I've been podcasting in various forms since 2007. So I've been doing it for quite some time. Um, there's a part of me that's just like, maybe I've literally said everything there is for me to say. Because podcasting is a completely different world now. Um, this show is visual, um, but most of the stuff I have done historically has not been. It's just been audio. And, you know, I've been sitting there going, do I, like, is it time to step back? You know, like, if I recommit, it's like, okay, I'll interview all the same fucking people again, which I've been doing for years and years. Or maybe this is like, I, I've, I've done it a bunch. Like, this we can keep doing, but like, whether I start a new podcast or not, I, I don't know. It's just something I've been thinking about lately. And I used to think I was very good at this um, and sharp and, and stuff like that. And, and speaking on a regular basis and doing it in front of people and whatnot made me sharper. Um, I don't know that I have anything new to bring to the proceedings. Like, when I started in podcasting, like, nobody else was doing it and it was easy to do new things. And I got to talk about shit I always wanted to talk about. And I spent years advocating for people to start podcasts. And they did. Everyone listened. And now the whole fucking world podcasts. And at that point, it's like, do I have anything to add? Now, when I started podcasting, it was never me going, what do I have to add? I just did it for the joy of like, what, I get to do this and nobody will say no? I just record whatever I want with whoever I want and stuff. But uh, having done that since 2007, which means I've been doing it for 16 years at this point, Maybe I've reached the end. Maybe I don't have anything to add to the medium and people have picked up the ball and, and ran with it and are doing great with it. And maybe it's like, oh, I, I was there in the beginning and now I should just kind of move on. So it's something literally that I've been thinking about for the last four or five weeks, going like, what, what am I going to do in the future about podcasting? And when you were like... I learned from the master. I was sitting there going like, I, I don't think I'm that anymore. Like I don't, and I'm not saying this for pity or anything like that. I just, there comes a certain time when you realize that like, oh, I've burned my brightest in that area. Um, that's as good as it's ever going to get. Um, and that's okay. You know what I'm saying? So I've been thinking a lot lately about like not, podcasting as much as I did. This I would always do because it's easy. He does most of the work. I just stand here and listen to fucking cool stories and stuff. But the other stuff, you know, where in the beginning I did it because it was like, holy shit, this is like keeping a massive diary. But I've been doing that for like 17 years and it went off the rails in terms of being about like my life. It involves so many other friends and like part of the joy of podcasting was being able to shine a light on people that I thought were fucking special and funny and people didn't necessarily know or something like that and I've I'm like I pretty much run out of people that I'm like ladies and gentlemen this motherfucker like I've introduced them all and and so now I'm like maybe it's just, maybe that's it like maybe I don't have to keep going you know and 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 I enjoyed it while it lasted. Maybe it's time to push back from the table and, and be thankful it ever happened at all. So anyway, when you said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've been going through a thing. And clearly, it's been on my head and heart. And so when he said the thing, I was like, oh my god. It's, it's striking at the core of, of who I am right now, my existential crisis about fucking podcasting. What well, can I tell you a thing? Yes. Uh, when I said that you are, I learned at the feet of the master, I was referring to you as a salesman, not a podcaster. <laughs> well, that I am the master at. <laughs> but also the know. other thing. I also don't know if I'm the master of that anymore. I used to be very good at selling one product only, Kevin Smith. And I don't even know how to do that anymore. Um, yeah. It's, <laughs> why is Oppenheimer up there? I, again, not sad. It's not like I'm depressed or anything. These are just, th honestly, uh, what I've learned over the course of the last year and what I've learned over the course of podcasting since 2007 is the cheapest form of therapy there is. Always best to, like, bring shit out 
and fucking talk about it. Because now I'll go home when, when the show's over and I'll get a thousand opinions from a bunch of strangers. <laughs> Most of them will be like, yes, yeah, stop, stop talking. <laughs> but there'll be some nugget in there which I'll be like, ah. There it is. Yeah. So sometimes it's best. Look, it's always best to talk it out. Don't keep it in, kids. Over to Bamp Man. He's got I, something to say. I was just going to say, because I've been doing, geez, when did. I started doing Babylon and Jay and Bob Get Old With You in March of 2011. Yeah. So, God, we've been doing this for 12 years, yeah. which is crazy. So now when I get asked to be on a podcast about a bar or about Star Wars or whatever, I'm like, how long do you need me on? And they're like, we'll do about 20 minutes. It's always two hours. All right. Because people are like, tell me about Jar Jar Binks. And then I stopped talking like two hours later. I was like, right. what's your next question? They're like, we're done. <laughs> so, but that's the reason to do it. Because in, like, in every other medium I work, it's all about brevity, right? It's all about like, keep it fucking short, keep it tight, can't go on forever, fucking has to have a beginning, middle end, three acts, so forth and so on. Uh, when you're doing press, it's all about keeping it tight and shit. What I've always loved about podcasting is like, there's no time limit here. Like, just go as long as you fucking want. And clearly, we're going on hour four right now and shit. So I like that, the freedom to just fucking express. They're like, you know, I was, one of the other things I did in the course of the last week was I went over Shannon Doherty's house and did her podcast. And it was lovely to see the medium through her eyes. Again, I've been doing this since 2007 and shit. She is brand new to the medium. And she talked about, she's like, this is better than fucking therapy. She's like, I, I feel hurt. I get to talk about things that like nobody ever asked me about and stuff. And that will always be like intriguing to me. Freedom to speak. You know, I've always held this theory that human beings need three things. Food, fucking, and to be heard. And podcasting, the root of that has always been to be heard. I'm just wondering if I've been heard enough. And, and that's me saying it. And I love the sound of my own voice. So anyway, that's where I've been thinking. But Fair thank enough. you for that. That was very kind <laughs> of you to say that it wasn't podcasting. <laughs> You're right. I'm a salesman first and foremost. I said that to my kid like fucking two months ago. She was like um, something about like, blah, blah, blah. You're an artist. And I was like, I'm not an artist. And she's like, yeah, you are. And I was like, no, I'm a salesman. She's like, what are you talking about? I was like, I just sell Kevin Smith. She goes, oh, it's so disgusting to hear. And I was like, why? She's like, because you're supposed to be an artist. I was like, oh, now you sound like the fucking internet. <laughs> Let me be whatever I'm going to be, for heaven's sakes. And I'm still figuring that out, even at age 53, as I'm sure most of us are, man. It's okay to not know where you are, kids. The important thing is always be asking the question, where am I? And, uh, you know, I've been asking that a lot lately. For hopefully not in the trunk of a car. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fucking hopefully true. Uh, this show really fucking got off the rails. <laughs> we got to like, the show, yeah. Let's take it off three Rock. hours now. Rock. Let me uh, tell you guys, I don't know where I am anymore. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I feel like he's having an identity crisis right in front of us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, kids of all ages, people everywhere, did you have a good time this evening? Uh, thank you for being here, man. Uh, give it up for uh, the man without whom we don't get to do a show in a very cool-looking bar. Look at this backdrop, fucking. It's fantastic. Give it up for Bamf Man himself, JC. And Andrew in the box. And Andrew in the box. Don't forget, every time you see an image up there, including us, and every camera change is done by Andrew. Give it up for Andrew, ladies and gentlemen. Here at the Scum and Villainy Cantina, it's a bar, they serve alcohol, they serve food, and that wouldn't happen without the staff. Give it up for the staff of Scum and Villainy Cantina. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, but we got no show without the guy standing to my left, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for the great Mark Bernardin, everybody. Thank you. Uh, and there we go, kids. That's going to do it, man. That is Fat Man Beyond for the year 20. 23. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. Kevin Smith. I'm Mark Bernardin. Tune in next year. Same fat time. Same fat channel. Spodcast.com or YouTube.com slash Kevin Smith. Big annual holiday Jeff's kiss, everybody. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. This is the Kev.
Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the AKA Ask Kev Anything. Every saga has a 10 year anniversary, ladies and gentlemen, and this is what happens when Jay and Silent Bob get old. I'm Kevin Smith. Kissing you!